Night had descended upon the land. It was snowing thickly. The silhouette of a girl could be seen in the distance. She was wearing a black hooded cloak. The snow gradually covered her footprints. She was probably very cold. Her hair was also blonde. The skin of her face was the color of snow. If it wasn't for the black cloak, you could almost blend in with nature. She had blonde hair and eyes that were devoid of pigmentation. They seemed as if they were transparent, colorless. The girl tried to confront her with the weather. She covered her face with her hands from the wind. The hood was already off her head, and her hair was developing in all directions. She was cold and very hard to walk. Outwardly, she looked like the Snow Queen. Even her eyes were ice cold. But she couldn't walk anymore. She needed help. But there was no one around. And the girl, exhausted, fell into the snow. Her body was completely disobeying her. She wanted to get up, but she couldn't. She wanted to take a few more steps, but she couldn't do that either. Gathering all her strength and opening her eyes, the girl thought, Is this really how she's going to end up? Is this really how she's going to leave her life? It was very insignificant. She clenched her hands into fists with the last of her strength. She wanted to resist the weather and her powerlessness, but she couldn't. A few hours ago, the events took place in the Brienne household. Someone addressed the girl, Estelle Brienne. The girl stood silent. Count Brienne, whose name was Aldente Brienne, turned sternly to the girl. What is she thinking? How long is she going to dishonor them? He couldn't believe it had occurred to her to go out on the street like that. She didn't want there to be any rumors that the lady of the Brienne family was spreading white sickness. The girl had white disease or albinism. It's an inherited disorder. It is manifested by complete or almost complete absence of melanin pigment. The Count said that everyone would whisper that it was a terrible disease in which everything dies white, as if it had turned gray. Next to the Count sat his wife, Lorelia Brienne. Count was ashamed to show his face to the public. If a girl has thoughts too. The Count had no time to speak before the butler came through the door. He said that a guest had arrived. Count Aldente was very surprised. He was not expecting visitors today. He was very curious to see who had come to see them. Suddenly the door swung open. A woman stood on the doorstep. She apologized for showing up unannounced, but she owed the Count something to say. The butler tried to stop the girl, but he failed. Lorelia looked menacingly at the butler. She asked him what was going on now. Butler said he would now try to explain everything. The girl who came said she was the Count's real daughter. At this time, the girl who had white sickness stood aside and listened to the conversation. She was stunned by what was said. After all, until then Estelle had thought of herself as the Earl's daughter. How could this be? The girl continued her story. When she was a baby, the nurse mistakenly confused her with another child. Count Aldente was horrified. He shouted that there was no such thing. The Count asked the butler to get the girl out of the door as soon as possible. Butler had not expected this turn of events. He stood looking down. It was as if the power of speech had been taken from him. He couldn't say anything. The girl in turn stood and smiled. She was going from foot to foot and asked the Count to watch. Her eyes were the same violet color as the Count's. Her hair was straw-colored. It was the same color as the Count's hair. Put this color on and was stunned. It was all right. Notice the color for a second. Putting everything together, it could be surmised that the girl was indeed from the Earl's lineage. Who then is the girl who has the white disease? After all, she was the one everyone thought was the Count's daughter. Aurelia called out to the butler once more. The Countess's appearance was harsh. The butler, unhurriedly on a tray, brought a letter to the Count. The letter had a seal on it. It was a letter of guarantee from the wizard. The Count took the letter in his hands and began to read it hastily. Just as Madame had said, the girl was indeed a native child. And as soon as the Count reached that point, he was at a loss for words. He turned to the girl once more and said, So she really is their native daughter. The girl was glad that the Count, and the Countess finally realized this. But it was so unexpected. After all, all this time they'd thought Estelle was their own daughter. They weren't very happy that she had white sickness. They thought it was contagious and shouldn't be let out. The girl said she was switched with her and pointed her finger at Estelle, the maid's daughter. Estelle only add in response. She stood looking with wide eyes at that girl, at the Count, at the Countess. As soon as she heard that, the forgotten memories came over her in the same second, about being in a novel she read in her past life. It was Countess Celia's Cinderella story, whose fortunes changed with the appearance of a beggar. And her role in this novel is merely a directorial device to describe the poor past of the main character, Celia. The girl stood clenched into fists. She wanted to explain but couldn't find the right words. The Count and Countess stood looking sternly at the girl. The Countess took a close look at her new daughter and said sure enough it was her. Yestel was upset. She didn't understand what was going to happen next. She stared wide-eyed at the situation. The Countess approached her new daughter and said that she was indeed their daughter. She spread her arms out in hopes of hugging her. The girl opened her arms too and said mother. Mother and daughter embraced. The Countess asked to be forgiven for the way things had turned out. Loralee was sorry they hadn't known this sooner. How on earth could this have run in the family? It was some kind of evil joke of fate. Of course it was a cruel joke. Looked at the girl who until this moment everyone thought was her daughter. 
This white ghost can't be a descendant of their family. And why didn't they realize it sooner? Why didn't they suspect anything before? Estelle was approached by the Count. The girl realized that now the Count was going to say some information about her, what she should do now and how to go on. The Count said he's sure she understands, but the girl had not expected this turn of events. She called him father once more. The Countess said that nevertheless a few servants would accompany her. The Brienne family has honor after all. And the Countess looked at the girl once more. But from the moment Estelle leaves this house, they will be strangers to each other. The Count told Estelle to return to her true place. It was bitterly cold outside. The girl stood in the street with her belongings. The courtiers couldn't understand what the thunder was all about. The servants ordered Mistress Estelle to go faster. Then they thought about it and decided that she was no longer a mistress at all. She's just a maid's daughter. The girl was upset. The servants were whispering among themselves. They were very curious to know who her father was, what kind of a mistress she was. And Estelle stood speechless. She had nothing to say. She didn't know her parents. Only footprints were left in the snow. Estelle was accompanied by the servants. They walked for a long time, but for some reason the guest house was nowhere to be seen. At that moment, Natural felt that her legs were not obeying. No matter how hard she tried to move them, it was in vain. She must be very cold. The girl also began to feel very dizzy. Why is this happening to her? Could it all be caused by white sickness? Or maybe she's just underdressed. The servants were nervous. They asked the lady to go faster, and the girl just physically couldn't do it. She was already well behind everyone. One of the servants shouted, What was she worrying about? Asked the girl to think about who had got them all kicked out of the county. One of the girls was really pissed off about it. She asked me to leave her to move on. Yestel didn't expect such an attitude from the servants. How could they treat people like that? Is it so easy to leave someone in trouble and not help them? The girl held out her hands to the group of people. She wanted to ask them to wait for her. The servant was being pushed further and further away. Yestel froze with her arm outstretched. Since she suffered from white sickness, she sort of blended in with the snow. They were the same with it. The girl was sad and wanted to cry, but she had no tears, and the blizzard kept blowing. The wind bent the trees, the snow fell. The girl fell into the snow. Her hands slowly lapped up the snowflakes. She didn't understand anything anymore, and it was as if she was immersed in a dream. At that moment, a man approached her. It was a hooded man. He quickly removed the hood with a single movement of his hand. He had dark hair and orange eyes, and the young man watched the girl carefully. He had not expected to meet a human being here. The girl was half covered in snow. All indications were that she was already dead. The young man turned away and wanted to leave, but a little hope entered his head. What if it was still possible to save her? The young man walked over to the girl and crouched down on his knee. He rolled her over onto her back. Laying her head on his knee, he felt for a pulse. The pulse was faint but palpable. The girl was lucky. The young man thought that she was likely to die soon, but both he and his hand tried to find something in his pocket. From his pocket, the man pulled a vial of purple glistening liquid. He pulled out the cork with his teeth. There was a purple glistening liquid in the bottle. Another second and the young man drank the liquid. After that, he lifted the girl's head with his hands and looked at her once more. The girl was of such a color as if she had died long ago. But the young man did not know that she had white sickness. He took it and kissed her. The girl had a slight change on her face. The young man looked at her and said that God would guide her after that. The young man walked up to some grand palace. He thought that no one would object to his latest kindness. He crouched down on his knee, then straightened up again. Here the palace was quite close. After that, he carried the girl in his arms closer to the palace. Dawn has come. Someone was walking down the palace corridor. There was a man moving quickly along the palace corridor. From his appearance, I could guess that he was a butler. He turned to the red-haired lad and called him Mr. Alond. The young man was practicing with his sword. He turned to the grandfather who approached him. The young man greeted the man. The butler said he needed to tell Mr. Allen something. The red-haired boy looked questioningly at the butler, and the man began his story. In fact, last night. And the man was silent for a moment. The red-haired guy asked what exactly had happened last night. The man was referring to the man in front of the door. Mr. Allen laughed, for he thought that such a statue as his brother had brought home his mistress. The men walked quickly down the corridor. From the man's words, it appears, last night, a black-haired guy showed up at the castle gate and dumped the girl in front of the house like a puppy. He looked at the man again to see if he was talking right, and the man asked if the butler had taken her in. The man bowed politely and said yes. The young man thanked the butler. The girl might as well have frozen. Mr. Allen did not understand where she had been sent from. The man only looked at his master kindly. At this time they came to the door. The butler knocked quickly on the door. Mr. Allen and the butler were standing in front of the door, but no one opened the door. Alond looked questioningly at the butler. The butler grabbed the handle and opened the door. When they entered the room, they saw a girl lying on the bed. Her face was like a white sheet. Her hair was the same as her arms. It was as if she was all white. Mr. Allen examined the girl carefully. He saw that her skin was too white. Butler said it's like she has white sickness. Mr. Allen said the girl was very thin. 
He just didn't understand, looking at her, how a person could be so thin. Her cheeks were sunken, her chin pointed, and her collarbone seemed to peek out. The young man also noticed her hands. Her fingers were very delicate, thin and long. White sickness was little known. Therefore, most people treated it as an infectious disease. Many people shied away from such people. Others were afraid to even touch a person's hand. Butler looked at Lloyd and realized that he knew and understood everything. He understands everything about this girl's condition. Alonde asked the butler about her condition. The man said that her fever had gone down considerably. The crisis had passed, so they could only wait for her to open her eyes. She probably needs to lie down and regain her strength. Mr. Along asked for more healers. The butler smiled and said obey. The first rays of sunlight fell on the girl from the window. They seemed to warm her skin which was thin and frozen. The girl felt warm at the same second. She opened her eyes and was sure she was dead. Well, as soon as she woke up and looked around the room she was very surprised. All around her was an interior of indescribable beauty. Large crystal chandeliers. Stucco on the ceilings. The girl sat on the bed and didn't understand what had happened to her. She didn't understand how she could have ended up here. The last thing she remembered was losing the creature. And she remembered how her legs wouldn't listen to her. How she couldn't follow the maids. The girl scrutinized the room. She had never seen such beauty before. The girl had not seen such brightly colored rooms even in the county. Everything was gilded. On the walls or brightly colored paintings. The floor was covered with bright burgundy carpets. Maybe it was a dream. Maybe she's asleep at this point. At that time the door opened. A tall, handsome, red-haired guy walked into the room. He said the girl finally woke up. The girl looked at the young man carefully and didn't realize who it was. At that moment, the young man raised his hand and reached for the girl. Estelle opened her eyes wide. For some reason, she thought the young man was going to hit her. After that, she squinted her eyes as if expecting a blow. But the young man simply touched his palm to her forehead and looked into her eyes. He was relieved that Fever was asleep. The girl looked at the young man in surprise. It was strange that the young man was not afraid to touch her. Can't he see that she has the white disease? The girl was horrified. He touched her with his hand. Previously, everyone had thought she was a ghost and shunned her. If you remember how Lorelai Brienne behaved, she would just cringe when she touched her suddenly. She started screaming that she had touched this white ghost. She asked the servants to bring her water immediately to wash her hands. People were very afraid of contracting this disease, only they did not know that the disease was hereditary. The countess immediately shouted that she needed to wash her hands immediately. Mr. Alon saw that the girl was uncomfortable. She was at that moment remembering how people had previously shunned her. So he asked her what was happening to her. And the girl thought that this man did not yet know that she had white sickness. So he touched her with ease. The maid suggested to the young man that I probably hadn't traveled yet. The girl should be given some time to regain her strength. Alon said that if the body has not yet gained enough strength, it is not worth getting out of bed. Lie down a little longer and regain strength. Yestel asked the young men what this place was. As she joked about it and who are all these people around her. The red-haired young man said it was his home. The girl realized that this was someone else's house, that it wasn't her house. That wasn't how she wanted to ask the question. She wanted to know where this house was. Alon said it was the Duchy of Valois. The girl looked at the young man in surprise. She could not believe it. She asked again. The Red Duke's family has protected the Empire since its founding. The name has been an idol of the people of the Empire. And red hair is the exclusive property of the Valois family. Alon could see that the girl was in a bit of a state of confusion so he suggested starting with a greeting. The young man introduced himself and said that his name was Alond Nord Valois. He is the second son of the Valois family. Yestel seemed to be replaying every word she said in her head. He is the second son of the Valois Alond family. And the girl looked at the young man in surprise without taking her eyes off him. Alond asked the girl what her name was. The girl sighed. She clenched her fists. If Alond now found out that she was the white ghost of the Brienne family, so would he and the girl shivered at the thought. The young man stood looking at her intently. At that moment, the girl didn't want to lie to the savior of her life. So she said her name was Estelle Brienne. After she mumbled for a moment, she thought for a moment. After all, she wasn't Brienne's family anymore. Aland repeated the girl's first and last name once more. He said that now, until she was better, they would live under the same roof for a while. He didn't want to let her go early. Hernasha extended his hand to the girl. He wanted them not to quarrel and to get along. And the girl wondered whether to take his hand or not. Couldn't he see that she was sick? The young man realized that the girl was not going to shake his hand, and she timidly said that her illness did not allow her to shake his hand. I couldn't find a smile. Is she really afraid he might catch a cold? As she can see, he is in good health, so there is no need to worry. After a few more seconds of thought, the girl held out her hand. When they shook hands, the whiteness of the girl's skin was clearly visible. Along asked her to take care of him and called her mistress natural Brienne. The girl didn't feel very confident. It was probably the first time someone had touched her hand so calmly and without fear. It had been a few days since she had taken up residence in the Duchy of Valois. 
The house was very beautiful. A maid was introduced to Mistress Estelle. She was bringing her food. The maid said that today's speciality was sea turtle soup. I realized that the girl was probably sick of eating only soup. The healer said that from tomorrow she would be able to eat grain bread. The girl smiled sweetly. She wasn't bored of it at all. Even if she had been eating it for days in a row, it was still delicious. It was the first time the girl had eaten such a delicious soup. The maids were very worried whether the girl liked the food or not. The chef who prepared the dish was also very worried. Estelle was surprised. Why should she worry if everyone had prepared excellent dishes? They were probably cooked by the best chefs. At that moment, the hand of the maid touched the hand of the mistress. Mistress Estelle's habit of constantly jerking her arm apologized. The maid also jerked her hand and looked at the mistress carefully. She quickly began wiping her hand with a tissue. The other maid asked what this rude act was, but the girl did it as if unconsciously. The maid didn't need excuses. She ordered her to get out quickly. She would have to take disciplinary action. The maid quickly left the room, and the second maid began to apologize to the mistress. She said that the girl had only recently started working here, so she had done something rude. The maid promised to train her and it would not happen again. Mrs. Yestel said she was fine. She quickly picked up her spoon and began to eat. Everything was delicious, just delicious. The girl couldn't believe that she was in such human conditions. No one had ever treated her like that before. If it wasn't for these people, she might have really died. And these people made her well. They tried their best to cure her. They brought in the best healers, even if it was out of sympathy. It was the first time in her life she had ever received so much care. And she wrapped her arms around the warm cup of tea. She looked into the cup and saw her reflection there. Could she really be so happy? The girl just couldn't believe that it was happening to her here and now. And Estelle looked at the maid carefully. The servant girl looked at her mistress in a friendly manner. Mrs. Yestel said it was a bit noisy outside today. She asked the maid if something had happened in the duchy. The maid looked as if she'd been startled by someone. She cried out for God's sake and what she'd forgotten. She forgot to tell mistress a very important thing. The second duke is coming back today. The mistress ate the soup and listened attentively to the maid. Perhaps he would arrive soon enough and the maid laughed. The girl finished her soup. She was curious to see what kind of second duke of Valois he was. Audrey's maid asked Madame not to worry too much. The second duke is a very good man. The girl smiled, she guessed. And in an instant, the girl's gaze faded. Even though Alan said it was fine, the second duke might have other things on his mind. What if she gets chased away again? And she'll wake up from that happy dream. The girl silently placed the empty plate on the tray. Estelle was already mentally preparing to leave the duchy. But at the stop, she would like to thank Aland. Well, when would be the best time to do it? The girl went to the window and looked out. What she saw in the window interested her greatly. She saw Mr. Alon standing outside chatting with another young man. Suddenly Duke Alon grabbed his hand from behind his interlocutor. After that he grabbed his heart with his hand. It was clearly visible that the Duke was not well. The girl looked out the window in surprise. She called out loudly to Mr. Alon. At that moment Audrey, who was standing with her back to Mistress, dropped her plate. She quickly asked Mistress what happened, why she cried out like that. Mistress Estelle that Mr. Alon has fallen. Audrey couldn't believe her ears. How could she? And the maid ran quickly to the window. In the square, she saw Alond crouch down and holding onto his heart. She realized at once that it was a harbinger of illness, and it was earlier than the last time. If the disease started again, there would be chaos all around. Audrey said it was dangerous to be here, but when she turned around, the girl was gone. Mistress was rushing down the corridor. She quickly ran down the corridor with all her legs. Here she was already running to the door and swinging it open. She rushed down the stairs. The girl ran and shouted the Duke's name. Audrey's maid caught up with her from behind. Along sat up, clutching his heart. Sweat dripped down his face. The mistress paused for a moment. Audrey's maid stopped behind her. Suddenly the girl saw people wearing white robes. These people were familiar to her. She had seen it when she was at the temple for the cure of white sickness. Those people also had the same robes. The girl decided that the duke was just overworked, and the mistress ran forward. The maid tried to warn her and tell her that it was dangerous, but Estelle wouldn't listen to anything. Duke Along stood up and straightened up. His eyes were already burning red. At that moment Mistress Natural ran up to him. The girl asked him not to move, and threw her arms around his neck. Duke Along's eye color has changed. Mistress said that when he is overwhelmed, he needs to relax as much as possible without moving. The girl could feel Duke's body relaxing. She could hardly keep it on her anymore. It was very, very hard for her. The butlers and maids lined up at the entrance. They were watching carefully. At that instant, Mistress Estelle and Duke Alon fell to the ground. The impact made the girl dizzy. The Duke covered her with his body. Mistress still had everything in her eyes and was dizzy. Well, the dizziness has stopped. Someone next to me said it's amazing. The girl looked over and saw someone's boots. A young man with the same red hair as Duke Alond asked the girl. She is a guest of Alan's. The events took place in the duchy office. The Duke of Lloyd stood by the window, brooding. He was still thinking about that incident. It had happened to his brother and the girl. He stood there repeating Estelle's name. Some thought kept him on his mind. 
What was it that had happened before his eyes today? The phoenix power in Valois' blood often caused serious overload in the human body. The man seemed to change. His eyes were starting to glow with red fire. It is a common chronic disease of four great families, including those blessed by God, and even the church could not cure this disease. And he remembered again how Mistress had hugged his brother. Perhaps it was a coincidence, or maybe it was just the girl's effect that had calmed everything down in an instant. Still, the Duke was inclined to think it was a mere coincidence. The Mistress couldn't have had that effect on his brother. Many thoughts were swarming in his head. A sudden spring at the door brought the Dukes back into the study. The butler stood on the threshold. He had to report to Mr. Louis about Mrs. Stell. The Duke turned to the butler and once more interrogated. The butler said that a few days ago their maid bumped into a maid from the Brienne family and talked to her. The latter said that they had a new mistress a few days ago. Lloyd was surprised. How could it be that there was a new mistress? Butler also said that the only daughter who was originally in the family has disappeared. And now the new Celia will be officially added to the family registry. A beam of light fell through the window into the mistress's room. It bounced off the shiny jug and spread across the room. Mrs. Yestel was lying on the bed. She was very upset. She was frightened. She didn't think the second duke would appear so suddenly. She wanted to prepare for this meeting somehow. Well, it worked out the way it did. He showed up when she was like this, lying on the ground, pinned down by the duke. She was so surprised that she couldn't even say hello properly and introduce herself. She's a white disease patient and she's so ill-mannered. With this attitude, she was starting to forget that she had white disease. No one thought she was a ghost. No one looked away from her. If she does get kicked out, how to live in the world of the novel? The world of the novel. She didn't know how she died in her past life, and how she was born a character in the novel. After all, the protagonist of this world is Celia Brienne. Here's why. The treatment in the county was as follows. But one thing was strange. The family was so rich that they weren't even afraid of the emperor. This is how the Brienne family was portrayed in the novel. This thought came to mind after she had already tried to remember her past life. But it seems that Brienne never had as many connections and wealth as she does in the novel. Celia was a passive character. Why did the content of the novel change? What caused it? At that moment, someone knocked on the door. It was a maid. She asked permission to enter. Audrey's maid came into the room. She asked Mistress if she had been frightened recently. From the looks of it, the maid thought that perhaps the mistress had injured herself somewhere. She laughed back. She was perfectly fine. The girl asked how Duke Alland was feeling, if he was all right. The maid said he's resting now. And besides. And the maid thought for a moment. Audrey said, does mistress know they say a lot of things? Estelle was confused. She asked again. Was it really her they were talking about a lot? The girl was curious to know exactly what they were saying about her. The maid was happy. She said that because of her, she would also become popular. The maid said that as long as she's been working here, she's never seen such a sight. And she wasn't the only one. Everyone in the duchy was amazed. Audrey's maid suggested that the girl go for a walk. She decided it would be better not to talk about it now. Mrs. Yestel asked if she could go for a walk. The maid said, of course you can. You see, she had been so frightened recently and it was necessary to correct the mood. The girl also emphasized that the master had also given permission. Estelle nervously crossed her hands in her lap. As for Mr. Lloyd, the girl clarified again if he didn't mind her being here. Audrey said that naturally Duke Lloyd would not object, and the maid quickly grasped her mistress's hand in her own. She said that the girl is Mr. Allen's benefactor, so you shouldn't say that. Estelle thought for a moment. What kind of benefactor could she be? And the maid still held the girl's hand and would not let her go. She wasn't afraid of the white sickness either. With such an attitude, Estelle stopped feeling different from everyone else. The maid dressed the mistress in a snow-white coat. She was very well dressed for it. Estelle considered her new outfit. It was not only fabulously beautiful but also very warm. The maid told me that Miss Sabelle wore this outfit, so she thought it would be perfect for her. After everyone was dressed, the maid suggested they go for a walk, and in Estelle's mind she wondered who Mrs. Sabelle was. Well, Grandpa decided to ask the maid this question later. The girls went for a walk around the duchy. The territory of the duchy was so large that there was no need to go somewhere else for an extra walk. If you walk around all the expanses of the duchy, you can have a wonderful walk. Mrs. Yestel was amazed at the beauty. The maid said that magic works here to keep the weather warm, so the garden is full of flowers all year round. Here they came to a charming gazebo. The maid asked if she would like to enjoy tea in the gazebo, and it was a nice day. The maid said she would prepare everything, and the mistress could rest for a while. She wanted to tell the maid to wait for her, but she was already gone, so Estelle was left alone on the bridge. The girl decided to go to the gazebo. It was beautiful. The girl began to stroll around and look at the fresh flowers that were in the gazebo. So she saw a young man in the gazebo. The young man also heard approaching footsteps turned round. He had blonde hair and blue eyes. The young man asked the girl who she was. Grandpa was so surprised to see someone else here. She was just speechless. Could it have been an angel? The young man waved his hand in front of the girl's face. Couldn't she hear him? 
He asked the girl again, Who is she? At that moment, Audrey was already coming into the gazebo. She was carrying a wheelbarrow full of flavored tea. The maid was no less surprised. Duke Ennard was standing in front of her. The maid asked the young man when he had returned. She was stunned that he had not told her of his arrival. The young man said that this was his home and it was not necessary to say he had come. At this time Miss Estelle instantly bent over. She greeted the Duke, also said that it was a pleasure to meet her. Inard guessed, most likely a new maid, but Audrey waved her head negatively. The maid asked the Duke, or rather he had already heard rumors about Alon's son. The maid said the main character in these rumors is here, and she's right in front of him, it's Mrs. Estelle. The young man looked at the girl in surprise with his blue eyes. He asked what she was doing with her body. After all, the girl was very skinny, just skin and bones. The girl was upset. It was unthinkable for the Duke. The Duke asked the lady if she had eaten anything. After all, the girl looked very weak. Estelle stood and every word the Duke said she replayed again in her head. The girl was stunned. Suddenly someone called out to her and the girl looked round. It was Duke Alond. He was happy and waved cheerfully at his mistress. Mistress Estelle cheerfully greeted the Duke as well. The blonde-haired young man was stunned. The girl quickly approached the Duke she had rescued. She asked if he was all right. The girl said he should rest some more. Duke said he was perfectly fine. Usually his family beat him unconscious, but they didn't do that this time. And it's all thanks to Mrs. Natural. The girl wondered, how could his relatives beat him to the point of semi-fainting? Duke Alond thanked the mistress for reassuring him, but it was dangerous. If it suddenly happened again, it was simply necessary to stay away from him. The girl said, well, if she helped him, it's all right. After all, Mr. Alland had saved her life recently too. Duke Ennard wondered why Alond was smiling so happily. Mistress Estelle said the Duke had a visitor. Alond guessed this visitor came from the temple. The girl stood looking at Alond in surprise. Her hands were getting a little expensive, as if she wanted to say something. Here she dared and approached Mr. Alond. She thanked him for his kindness, but explained that her illness was unfortunately incurable. She had seen many doctors in her life, but they all said as one and the same that this disease could not be cured. The girl was upset. She had come to terms with her illness a long time ago. Just now she felt how people could treat her kindly, and she liked it. She forgot for a while that she was sick. Duke Alon said with a smile that nothing in the world is impossible. If you want to, you can always find a way out of any situation. Estelle was stunned by the words. No one had ever said such a thing to her before. She felt that she was doomed for life. Duke Ennard and the maid Audrey stood aside. They were watching the duke and the mistress carefully. The maid was smiling. The young man was serious. Night has fallen. The healer sat in front of the lady with his head held high. He was not very cheerful. Swallowing his saliva, the young man began his story. He said the white disease had progressed significantly. Duke Alon said everyone knows that, and it's not news. It was important for him to find out exactly how the disease could be dealt with. The girl obediently asked how much time she had left. She had almost got used to the idea that someday she would have to die. The two dukes froze. They were very much struck by the speech that the lady might soon die. Duke Ennard was sitting on the sofa. This speech stunned him too. Estelle lowered her head. She waited to see what the healer would tell her. She was ready to accept whatever information he had to say. After all, she had been preparing for this for a long time. What could be three years? Or it could be ten years. The healer said he'd risk his life to extend it another ten years. Life extension was not a happy word. But with his powers, there was no way to cure her. Alond ran up to the girl and stood behind her back. He demanded a healer to tell him who could help with this illness. And the young man replied that her illness should be dealt with by the head priest. That was good news. The dukes began to think about what to do now. With all due respect, the head priest doesn't go out unless there is trust. The sick style will not be able to reach the temple on its own, so nothing can be done. A way must be found for the priest to want to leave and come to the duchy on his own. Alond was willing to spend a lot of money and make him come to the duchy. All the dukes thought the young man had gone mad, but Lloyd also supported his brother. He said it wasn't a bad idea. Our priest was on his knees and his head was full of question. He looked quickly at the girl. He couldn't understand who this girl was, that they were willing to spend so much money for her. The girl looked with her clear eyes. She was very pretty, even though she was sick. The events took place in the study. Duke Ennard walked in on Cloyd. He said that he had done a job he shouldn't have done. The brother said it was not a request but an order. The young man said he beheaded the three and left them in the warehouse. Lloyd said it's a great job. Ernard understood everything. There was only one thing he didn't understand. Why the brothers were trying so hard to help this guest. He even called the high priest. He didn't think Lloyd liked helping people. It was probably the other way round. Lois replied that he had seen her help Alond. He didn't make it to the chaos. The girl had managed to calm him down. Attention, brother. It wasn't magic or some other power. It was something else. Somehow Alond is coming round to me. He's just sleeping. Could it be that all these strange changes with the Duke are because of the guests? Or maybe it's just a coincidence. 
Duke Lloyd didn't think it was a mere coincidence. Coincidences like that are very rare. Everyone knew how Duke Alond endured the overload. It was getting too hard. Chaos was beginning to break out in the duchy. All the court maids had experienced this before. This time it was all right. The guests did not harm the duke in any way. And the favor he did, it paid off handsomely. Duke Alon saved that girl from death, and she helped him through the overload. The duke agreed with his brother's words, but there was only one thing he did not understand. Why his brother and he were in such a state. He's a bit too cheerful. It was said that when Mrs. Estelle touched him, the pain receded. It's an incredible case. One could only assume the pain of overload, and then a miracle happened, and the pain went away. The Duke wanted to keep Mistress Estelle in the duchy until she was fully recovered. What if Duke Aland had another overload? Lovett had already told his father what had happened, and he was returning home. Duke Enard was surprised. Would his father really be coming home? The Duke catches confirmation that his father is coming home. He'll arrive tomorrow. Duke Enard understood. He was about to leave. Leaving the young man thought that now from the renovations, the mansion would be very noisy. Duke Lloyd did not react to Ennard's statement. He sat in his thoughts. At that moment, something caught his attention, and he looked away. He looked at a certain envelope that lay on his desk, and it had been brought to their attention that Archduke Karlstein had arrived in the capital. Louis took another look at the sealed envelope. The envelope was sealed and tied, so it was clear that it had not been opened yet. Lloyd asked where this information came from. The counselor said that it was reported by the Karanka Guild itself. Duke Lloyd took the envelope in his hands. It had been five years since Erz Duke Carl Stein had been seen in the Grand Duchy. Duke Lloyd was very curious what he was up to. This man wouldn't just turn up like that. There must be some good reason. Among the four families that were published defending the continent, the Grand Duchy of Karlstein has the blood of the most divine beast. Their strength was immense, but it was the Duke of Karlstein who suffered the most from this blood. Because of this family rarely traveled outside the duchy. The current Archduke Claude Karlstein was no exception. Duke Lloyd opened the envelope and quickly began to read the information. In the envelope was a letter and a photograph. The letter lived at the capital. The events took place in the duchy, specifically in the gazebo which were located on the grounds of the duchy. Estelle stood and scrutinized the foliage in the park. The surprising thing was that there had been a snowstorm a few days ago, which made it impossible to see anything. The girl was surprised that everything was blooming and fragrant now. It was as if the blizzard had never happened. Luckily, she was in the Duke's mansion. She was also wondering where she would earn a living when she left the mansion. You have to find some kind of job that she's good at. The only thing she's good at is embroidery. Since the girl was practically shunned from childhood, she sat in her room and embroidered. Her embroidery was quite beautiful. The girl was very happy that she could do something too, but that she didn't remember most of the novel. Suddenly Estelle heard a noise. The girl turned her head and looked in the direction where the noise came from. She wondered what the noise was. Outside the duchy, Servants and maids were lined up at the gate. All indications were that they were meeting someone. They stood and greeted the Lord. A carriage pulled up and the door opened. A man stepped out. The man's name was Clément Valois. He was the Duke of Valois. The man was tall, good-looking. He had long hair the color of fire. The Lord looked round the neighborhood. It had been six months since he had been home. The Duke greeted the butler, whose name was Euron. The butler stood and smiled. He hoped the gentleman had had a good trip. The Duke of Valois was approached by his three sons. Two of them had brightly colored hair. The youngest was blonde. All the sons were happy to see their father back. The Duke of Valois looked round at everyone present. It was his large family. But here his gaze stopped on someone. Behind the sons stood a blonde girl. She stood with her cross in her hands and her head lowered. The father realized that this was some new person. The girl walked closer to the Duke and greeted him. She was very happy to meet him. The girl hurriedly introduced herself. Her name was Estelle. She said she was a guest and had been staying at the Duke's mansion for some time. The Duke said he'd already heard about it, so the girl's been living here for about three days. The Duke said there was a severe cold snap a few days ago. He also asked how she'd lost consciousness. The girl, a little embarrassed, began her story. She told the Duke of Valois that the man she had called father all her life kicked her out of the house. This information really hurt Duke Alland. He was in despair. How could his father do such a thing? Clement Valois once more interrogated. Did the girl mean to say that her own father had done that to her? He was curious to know why he had done so. Duke Alland intervened in the conversation. He didn't like the fact that her father was so thoroughly interested in her history. But the girl continued her story. As it turned out, her real mother was a servant, but who her father was was still unknown. Everyone said that she had been confused at birth with the real daughter of the Count of Brienne. Now the Duke stood listening attentively to the girl's every word. Estelle said it doesn't make sense now. Her former family probably thinks she's already dead. When they found out she wasn't their own daughter, they just turned their backs on her. They'd even be glad the girl left them. The girl said she was very glad. After all, in this mansion she is not treated like a ghost. People don't seem to notice her illness. 
She doesn't feel like an outcast. The girl Estelle said that their kindness made her very happy. All the court servants and maids stood and listened breathlessly to the girl's every word. She continued, Even if she has to leave this place, she doesn't want to be the ghost of the Blin family. From the girl's words, Clément Valois realized that her name was Estelle. Nothing else matters. After all, she's still a small and fragile child. Hertz had three children, and it would never have occurred to him to do that to any of them. He realized, since the girl was born into a family of aristocrats, she was completely unfit for work. She said her parents kicked her out, so she had no money either. It was all true. The girl stood and clenched her fists. Clement Hare said she was having a hard time with what had happened, so he turned to Mistress Estelle again. He came closer to the girl, extended his hand to her. The man offered her to live in the duchy. The girl was very surprised to hear such a thing. Her eyes rounded and her face was very surprised. Everyone was dumbfounded. While Clement continued his speech, he said the girl could live in the Valois mansion and he's doing her a gratuitous favor, for she used her body to ease the pain and her son Alond. A thought swirled around in the duke's head. The maid's daughter. After a little thought the girl replied. She was very grateful to the duke for the offer, but there was one but. The duke interrupted her. Did she really think he was doing this out of pity? He asked her not to make him laugh. Then why is he doing it? The girl didn't understand the duke. The duke of Valois said that he was offering it to her because... And he thought for a few seconds. He said he wanted the girl. The girl was equally surprised. After all, this was the first time the duke was seeing her. Why would he want her? Suddenly one of the innard sons clapped his hands loudly he told his father. Everyone knows his father is impulsive. Well, when they talked about it, he said he'd be on his side. So why now the father's changed his mind abruptly? Father said it was just a suggestion for Mrs. Estelle. He is in no way pressurizing, so you can think about it and take your time to answer. The father apologized for burdening the girl. The girl said okay, she would think about his proposal. Duke Clement of Valois said welcome to Valois. He assured the girl that they would take care of her. The girl stood looking at the duke in surprise. She did not know what to say to her. The events took place in the kingdom. Several days had passed. The maids were in the room dressing up Mistress Estelle. Audrey said she was sorry the duke would not be able to join her for dinner. That made the girl laugh. She didn't have to worry that he would bring up the subject of custody again. For some reason, the girl was very amused by this. Estelle laughed a little and made a serious face and went to dinner. She walked slowly down the stairs holding onto the banister. She was dressed in a dark blue dress with white lace. The girl looked at the interior once more. It wasn't the first time she'd been here, but every time she'd been here, she'd been delighted. After all, the mansion couldn't compare to this at all. The girl slowly walked into the dining room. The dining room was huge and spacious. She was walking in a long dress. Looking at the interior, the girl forgot to lift a little the long dress, so she stepped on the hem with one foot, beginning to lose his balance Estelle out. At that moment, the Duke of Lloyd was beside her. He quickly picked up the girl to keep her from falling. He asked if she was all right. His eyes lit up. When the girl turned around, she saw Lyda. The girl was a little dumbfounded. Lloyd looked carefully at his hand, which he had just used to touch Estelle. The girl said she was perfectly fine and thanked Duke Lloyd for catching her. The girl was a little embarrassed. Lois looked at Estelle carefully. After that, he looked carefully at his hand. As he walked to the dining room, he had a terrible headache. Well, as soon as he caught the girl and took her hand, the headache went away abruptly. Could it be a coincidence? Well, like he said before, such coincidences are highly unlikely. What's going on then? Lloyd and Estelle came to the door in the dining room. They quickly opened the door and went inside. The girl was a little embarrassed as always. You could tell by her demeanor. Her arms were always crossed. In the dining room, Duke Alond and Ennard were sitting at the table. They greeted Lloyd and Estelle cheerfully. Duke Ennard was very surprised. He had not expected to have guests for dinner. Mistress Estelle realized that the Duke probably did not want to see her at the family dinner. The girl stood there trying to find the words to answer her. But Ennard quickly interrupted her. He bid her to sit down quickly for he was very hungry, and until they were all assembled, dinner would not begin. The girl came out of her thoughts and at a loss for words agreed. The girl thought about the fact that the youngest son was afraid of her. She walked up to Duke Ennard and sat down beside him, and the young man was surprised. Before her father, she had been so bold and said what she wanted, and now suddenly she was so quiet and modest. The girl ran the word humble through her head once more. She looked carefully into the Duke's eyes. After that, she quickly looked away. God, what had she done? She looked straight into the Duke's eyes. Afterwards, Duke Alond told the girl that a parcel had arrived for her. Estelle was surprised. She asked again. It was she who had received the parcel. And the young man initially thought it was sent by his father, but they said the sender's name was not given. Everyone was wondering who the girl's parcel came from. The girl was equally surprised. Had the parcel really come to her? But she didn't expect parcels from anyone. Who could know that she was here? Lloyd was also looking at Estelle intently. The girl walked over to the table. There was a box on the table. 
She stretched out her hands to the box and wanted to open it. Who could it be? It was a mystery to her. She didn't think it was from anyone in Brienne's family. Her previous parents seemed to have completely forgotten about her. At that time, Estelle was called out by someone. The girl turned round to see who it was. A voice asked if Mistress Estelle could come in for a moment. Duke Lloyd appeared at the door. He apologized for calling her suddenly. The girl said it was all right and nothing was wrong. She asked Lloyd what was wrong. I wanted to ask a girl for one thing. The girl looked at the parcel. Well, before he asks her for anything, could she open the parcel first? The girl apologized and said that she was also very, very interested in what was in the parcel, and also who sent it to her. The girl quickly lifted the lid of the box, and she and Duke Lewis looked into it. The box contained a roll of paper casket and a small box with a coat of arms. It was some kind of symbol. The Duke catches a careful and surprised look at the items in the box, a small box with a coat of arms on it, and opened it. There was no limit to her surprise. In the box was a ring with a sky-blue colored stone. Mistress Estelle was quickly approached by Audrey's maid. She was dumbfounded. There was a diamond ring inside the box. Mistress Estelle said she doesn't know much about stones, so she couldn't tell if it was a diamond or not. The ring was very beautiful. It was just beautiful. The Duke of Lloyd had one question who had sent it. The box had a gilded coat of arms on it. The girl came to her senses a little and decided to open the package that lay inside the box. That was right. If the package that was in the box was a letter, it might shed some light on who sent it. The girl quickly unwrapped the package and read the letter, a letter that now he had found you, also the word sorry. The enclosed items are now hers. The signature was to a niece who had never seen one. The Duke of Lloyd and the maid asked for clarification, why the word niece is mentioned, whether Mistress Estelle is related at all. The girl then decided to open a large box. As soon as she started to open it, a bright light spread out. The girl saw a large gold-framed stone in the box. It was very shiny and lustrous. It shone so brightly that it blinded the girl's eyes. Mistress Estelle felt dizzy. Duke Lloyd caught the girl by the shoulders, and the stone began to fall to the floor. She felt as if she'd been electrocuted. Duke Lloyd looked carefully into her eyes. He told the lady that her eyes. The girl didn't realize what had happened to her eyes. Her eyes became a sky-blue color. They became the color of the stone that was in the box. The duke asked Audrey's maid to bring the mirror quickly. The maid understood and was already running to the girl with the mirror. Mistress and looked at her reflection. She didn't understand why her eyes. Was it because of the stone? Was the stone the tears of the dragon? No one had ever heard of it before but to me a dragon's tears. This stone was of extraordinary beauty. And it had magical properties. The duke called out to Estelle. He asked the girl to listen to him carefully. Years ago when the earth was destroyed, four similar beings blessed the humans. Among them was a family blessed with Phoenix. This family was the Valois. The distinguishing feature of this family was the bright color of their hair. The next family was blessed with a griffin. Archduke Karlstein had a connection to the current imperial dragon. And finally blessed with unicorns, the Mercedes family. This family had the same power as the imperial family, but was executed for treason overnight, despite their sad fate. The long-standing popularity of the Mercedes family was not easily dispelled. After all, after the death of the Mad Emperor, the present emperor recognized that the treason verdict was wrong. He apologized and restored the honor of the Mercedes family. Well, there's no family left, Mercedes. That can accept an apology. The holy relic of the dragon's tears is a utopia for godlike beings. She was the ideal for tamers. The lineage of Mercedes occasionally appears someone who is able to respond to the dragon's tears. Duke Ennard joined the conversation. He asked for a shorter story. Does the brother mean to say that what they thought was family was actually the maid's daughter? Well, on closer inspection, it turns out her mother was a descendant of the Mercedes family. The girl sat down on the couch and started crying. It sounded like a complete absurdity. How could this have happened to her? The letter clearly says my niece. So she's still alive. Liana Mercedes. The girl looked at Clément Valois in surprise. It all adds up. The last descendant of the Mercedes family is her aunt. The girl was stunned by the story. She clutched the letter in her hands and did not know what to do next. When this gets out, the whole continent will take notice. There will be no hiding it. People don't need to be told, they'll find out for themselves. Hertz Clement Valois said the girl had an extraordinary talent, and also warned the girl that all sorts of cunning gods would stick their heads out in front of her nose like sheep, and that's even what the dragon himself would do. But it wasn't just that. She knew how badly people overloaded with divine blood suffered. One touch would make everything clear in a split second, essentially to that guy. And Duke and Arth looked at his brother Alond. Folo said that the priority at the moment was to protect Miss Estelle, Clement Valois asked Lloyd to find out about the person who had delivered the parcel. Lovett agreed. He was ready to start investigating right away. The girl sat in front of the parcel and stared intently into the distance. A very large amount of information was now piling up on her. How to deal with it all? She never knew she had an aunt. Why did she only turn up now? Why the girl had never heard anything before? 
or perhaps it was her way of protecting the girl from imminent doom. The events took place in the Imperial Castle of the Asterio Empire. The counselor came to the Emperor's desk and told him some information. This information was such that the Emperor jumped out of his chair. He couldn't believe his ears. I wonder if the dragon has gone mad. The Emperor's name was Johann Asterio. Oh, he was the first prince of the Asterio Empire, the counselor said. As it was reported to him that the target was almost torn apart because of the fire. The young man recounted the information with his head bowed low. It wasn't mental. The Emperor couldn't understand what followed it. After all, it had been ten years since he had taken the pill and fallen asleep. Everything had been fine and perfect. Ten years ago, he couldn't handle a captured baby dragon, so he decided to put it to sleep with medicine every day. No matter how strong the creature was, he couldn't wake up. There was probably enough shock to overcome the effects of the drugs. The only thing that could have woken the dragon. I can't believe it's possible. Did the Mercedes family relic of the dragon's tears turn up somewhere? Records show that even when the dragon went berserk 100 years ago, there was a person in the Mercedes family who reacted to this gem. When interacting with the dragon's tear, even dangerous gods can be dealt with. It was a great threat to the imperial family. The late emperor got scared and made the worst possible choice. He was a fool. As I expected, the Mercedes family could not be completely exterminated. Whether she's still alive. The emperor knew a few secrets, but it was an obvious fact. If only she had a child. And the emperor slammed his fist forcefully into the armrest. At that moment, someone knocked on the emperor's door. He asked what was wrong. Some man wanted to meet him. The individual claimed to be a member of the Karanka Guild. The man said that he had information that might be of interest to him. Bone says it has to do with the Mercedes family. The emperor was willing to meet with him. The emperor smiled cheerfully and asked to bring a guest. He was ready to meet him and talk to him. The Duke of Lloyd was walking down the corridor. Through the handrail, he saw that a carriage of some sort had arrived. The carriage stood outside the palace. A young man with a message in his hand stood beside the carriage. Duchy of Valois, accept the order of His Majesty the Crown Prince. The Duke was surprised. What kind of order? But the informer continued. The word of His Majesty the First Crown Prince Johann of Asterio, as a faithful servant of the Asterio Empire. Suddenly the Duke interrupted him. He said that the young man had a very long tongue. Duke Lloyd asked for a summary, briefly and clearly, without any introduction or preamble. His Majesty wants the entire Valois family to attend the Fifth Crown Prince's birthday party a week later. Duke Lloyd was alarmed. Is it really on principle to invite him? It's not about that invitation. It's not about personally inviting the Duke. All aristocratic families are invited to the ceremony. Will only the Valois family be left out? Alienation is when the strong exclude the weak. But in this case, it should be the other way round. Their family must go to the prince's birthday party. At this time, the Duke of Anard approached the carriage. He called out to the guest dressed in imperial clothes. The young man immediately turned round. The Duke asked if he was the crown prince's man. And the young man greeted him cheerfully. The guest looked at the Duke. He wondered if he too was of the Valois family. If so, then the guest will have to tell us what order he gave, one by one without error. The guest in the Emperor's things felt as if he had been electrocuted. He did not know what to answer him. Someone knocked on the door. The door opened and Estelle peeked into the room. She had been told that the Duke had summoned her. The girl looked superb as always. She was wearing a pink dress. Well, now the girl had sky blue eyes. In the room, Clement Valois sat at the table as well as the Duke of Lloyd. Clement Valois turned to Mistress Estelle. The seeming crown prince has noticed her existence, and he knows exactly where she is. The girl was stunned by this turn of events. Perhaps the principal will try to get her by any means necessary, and make her his puppet. The girl was frightened for a second. Was it all because of her blood relation to the Mercedes family? After all, she wasn't just Estelle anymore. She was Mercedes now. Duke Clement of Valois said that the girl was now a more politically important personage than she could imagine. Naturally, the Valois family can hide her from the crown prince. But this prince is a man as persistent as a snake. He will try his best to find her. After all, he needs her for his personal interests. So? And the duke didn't say enough. Well, the girl stood looking intently into his eyes. What would he propose to do? How to do the right thing in this situation? Duke Clement of Valois asked the girl. Why doesn't she do the opposite? She needs to speak confidently, not hide. And he could help her do that. Does she really need to do this to keep anyone from touching her? And her previous family's remarks came back to mind. How long are you going to embarrass us? No one could believe that it had occurred to her to go out on the street like that. It was embarrassing. Those words had been running through the girl's head for a long time. Hiding from everyone was her everyday life. Does she want to live in hiding now, or show herself? There was no such choice for her before. Well, now the dukes were asking her. They wanted her opinion too. They didn't order her. They considered her. And the young men looked at the girl carefully. They waited for her answer. The girl was a little confused. She couldn't find the right words at the moment. What was she to do, at least until this moment? The events took place in the prince's kingdom. 
everything was ready before the prince's birthday celebration. There were many young ladies standing in the hall. They were all dressed up in beautiful evening gowns. There were buffet dishes on the table to welcome the guests. The ladies were saying that it seemed that many wonderful people were gathering here today. Countess Lorelia Bryan was also at this banquet. She said that was right. It was the Crown Prince's birthday banquet. One of the girls told the lady that one of the great families will be here today. Duke Clement Valois arrived at the palace with Estelle Mercedes. When they got to the door and were stopped by the butler, he quickly reported that the last lady had arrived. His Excellency the Duke Element de Valois has arrived with, and everyone was enchanted by the girl's beauty. Who was this stranger? The girl was confident. She was walking under the arm of Duke Clement Valois. This girl was Lady Estelle Mercedes. Her hair was neatly done. On her ears were earrings with the same stone as her eyes. The girl had eyes of incredible beauty. Everyone present began to greet Duke Clement de Valois. There were enthusiastic cheers from everywhere. It's Lady Estelle Mercedes. Everyone was surprised. Mercedes. They must have mispronounced her last name. How could that be possible? After all the events, she was the only survivor of the family, and the girl slowly walked down the stairs with the Duke. She was a little nervous, but she tried to calm herself. Her excitement was noticed by the Duke. He asked the girl if she was nervous, but Estelle quickly gathered her strength and said she was fine. The Duke calmed down. He raised his head high and asked the girl to behave at ease. After all, he was near and nothing bad would happen to her. The girl said well. If she wasn't prepared for this, she wouldn't have come to this ball. The girl saw representatives of her family here. Here in front of her stood the very girl who had come and told her that she was the real daughter of the Blinn. That girl's name was Celia. Estelle was very surprised to see Celia here. Celia herself was equally surprised. After all, her family had thought the girl had died long ago. Duke Clement Valois turned to Estelle. She turned to him quickly and smiled. The Duke suggested she dance with him. The girl agreed. It was more of an honor for her to dance with the Duke. Against the Duke's background, the girl seemed very fragile and small. The Duke said he would have asked someone else. All the ladies are already taken. Estelle laughed at these words. They walked to the center of the hall. The Duke gently put his arm around the girl's waist. The music started up and they spun dancing. The girl danced and could not believe her eyes. It was like a dream. I'm from the family she thought she belonged to. She would feel so good and comfortable in someone else's family. And now she's at this fancy ball, and she looks just as good as the others, and even better. The Bryan family could never afford it. Well, here was a girl gripping the wall. Even though she'd done one dance, it was too much for her. As I expected, it was very hard for her to dance so much. Though she forgot about her illness for a while. Well, the disease didn't forget about the girl. Here someone handed her a glass of red wine. She looked carefully at the flute. The Duke brought the glass. He brought her a drink. The girl was surprised. She thanked the Duke and took the flute. When she tasted the wine, she went full oriental. It was very tasty. At this point, he looked around. He said that everyone was looking at her. It seemed almost everyone in the room wanted to meet her. The girl looked around in surprise. It seemed to her that they were more interested in the Duke than in her. At this time, someone called out loudly to the Duke. The man and the girl looked around. The butler ran towards them. It was obvious that the young man was in a hurry. He quickly ran up to the Duke and said something in his ear. Estelle couldn't hear a single word. After that, the Duke said that he needed to step away for a while. He asked the girl not to be afraid, for he was not going far away. Estelle said she would be all right, and let him go. She watched the Duke and the man leave with her eyes. In her mind, she kept telling herself that everything was all right. She looked at the glass once more. She wasn't afraid to be alone. At that moment, the girl heard someone call out to her. The girl raised her sky-blue eyes and looked. In front of her stood three girls. One of them was called Elodie Robert. The girl was very pleased to meet Miss Estelle Mercedes. The girl smiled and greeted Miss Elodie. At that moment, she placed her flute on the table. The girl really admired Estelle's hair. They were so delightful. They struck her as soon as the girl entered the hall. Melody herself had hair that was short and red. The girl was a little embarrassed. No one had ever admired her beauty before. She had really blonde long hair. The girls surrounded Estelle and began to talk. The Duke watched from afar. At this time, someone exclaimed. There was a woman standing in front of the girls. She couldn't believe her eyes that the girl was from their family Mercedes. And the woman wondered if the girl was the daughter of a Viana. But Estelle was not the Liana's daughter. She was her niece, and Liana was her aunt. Unfortunately, she never met her. The woman said it was right. It looks like the blood genes have been preserved. This brought the woman to tears. She quickly took out a handkerchief and began to wipe away the dripping tears. The woman calmed down a bit and said that she didn't introduce herself. Her name is Maria Stelitzian. She was the Liana's godmother. The girl was shocked. Could it be that her aunt? The woman cried again. The day it happened, she had been communing with the vines. If only she had spotted and hidden the baby in time. This was exactly the case when the imperial family accused Mercedes of betrayal. Did her aunt still feel guilty? And she thought for a second. 
The girl thanked Maria for still remembering her mum. Estelle said if her aunt was alive, she would certainly be grateful to her. She didn't even know what she looked like, but somehow she was 100% sure that she really would. Maria took the girl's hand and bowed. She was very grateful that the girl had said that. Maria said whether she was a very kind woman or not. Too bad Maria couldn't protect her, but in that moment, the woman swore. In the name of the Marquis of Stelzian, she will protect her. At all costs. The girl was very surprised to hear such words. She was touched. Maria's vow was a great generosity to her. Only recently, no one had even paid attention to her. No one had defended her. And now she had such support. Estelle said she wanted to get to know her better. Maria said they would still have plenty of time. She promised she would. The woman stood and squeezed the girl's hands. She wasn't afraid to touch her either. Everyone was still in the royal palace. The girl was greatly surprised. Why, after Maria left, everyone started coming up to her. Those present wanted to socialize with the girl. But this made the girl very tired. A thought popped into my head. Most likely, the Duke didn't leave on business. He did it on purpose. At this time, the Duke had been watching the girl the whole time. He stood behind the column and considered. Who was approaching her? Who was chatting? After the conversation, the girl sat down on the couch. Social life was not for her. She was not used to it. Her illness also took away her energy. At this time, two young men approached Estelle. The young men approached the girl and introduced themselves. They were ambassadors of the Duke of Karlstein, and at the moment they were accompanying Arya Karlstein. Miss Estelle greeted them gallantly. Karlstein. She had heard that name somewhere before. The boys wanted to talk to Miss Estelle alone. The girl was surprised that they wanted to talk to her, and alone. It seemed strange. One of the young men said it wouldn't take long, and he once again asked the girl to come with them and talk. The girl looked carefully into their eyes. After that, they went out onto the balcony. It was already getting dark outside. The young men said they were here to clarify something. The girl stood and listened to them attentively. The young man turned his attention to the girl's eyes. Her eyes? One of the boys asked why her eyes were like that. He apologized for asking so bluntly. Well, if that's how she reacted. And the young men quickly lowered their heads. They said that the Duke wanted to meet her. Estelle interjected. Did the Duke himself really want to meet her? The young man said that was exactly what it was. The Duke of Karlstein needs her help. The girl seemed to come to her senses. She asked me to wait. It was all right. She just remembered now who Archduke Karlstein was. It was a black-haired young man. He was the main character in this world and was related to the Mistress Wasilia. I wonder if the young men mean Claude Karlstein. That was right. He was the one they represented. But the girl didn't understand why he wanted her. Unfortunately, the young men couldn't give her the details, just the Duke of Karlstein. And the young man didn't finish. At that moment, Celia came out onto the balcony. She interrupted their conversation. The girl didn't expect anyone to be here, and she yelped. The girls suddenly met each other's eyes. Estelle didn't expect to see Celia in front of her, nor did Celia expect to see Estelle here. Celia gallantly apologized. She wanted to speak to Miss Estelle, but she hadn't realized at all that she wasn't alone here. The young man apologized to the lady and said they had a mixture of Mercedes, and Celia interrupted the young man again. So she's no longer Estelle Brienne, but Estelle Mercedes. That was weird. Celia was very surprised to see. She was getting worried because she hadn't seen her at the mansion. It was weird. Estelle got the feeling that the girl knew. One of the young men said to sat down that it was very rude. Celia decided that the young men now wanted to insult her, but that was not what the representatives meant at all. Suddenly someone else is out on the balcony. It was the Duke of Valois. He said that all three were taking up a lot of his ward's time. The young men apologized to Miss and said they would meet later. Celia stood and looked at them angrily. Hertz noticed that look. So he asked the girl if she wanted to say something. Turned round and walked away. The girl said she was a minor character. This surprised Estelle very much. Dazed, Estelle turned round and looked after Celia. A question swirled in her mind. What had that girl just said? The Duke brought her out of her stupor. He turned to Mistress Estelle and asked her what she was worth. The girl asked the Duke to wait for a while. Mrs. Estelle rushed into the hall. She'd heard it clearly. A minor character. Whatever that means. While the Duke of Valois stood on the balcony. He didn't understand the girl's behavior. Estelle was confused. There was no way Celia could have found out about this. How had it come to this? Mistress Estelle walked quickly back into the hall. She looked around, but the girl was nowhere to be found. It was as if Celia had vanished without speaking. At that moment, Mrs. Estelle heard a child's voice, a voice asking for help, and she clearly heard these words, Help me. The girl stopped and listened. The voice was, in all probability, heard through the window. She moved closer to the window and listened again. The voice came from the direction of the forest. The girl clearly heard a child's voice. A thought immediately flashed through her mind probably some child in distress. Mrs. Estelle did not hesitate and went quickly into the street. She walked in the direction the voice had come from. The girl was already walking in the woods, and the voice kept asking, 
It was begging for help. The voice said that if this continued, he would die soon. The last words really hurt the girl. And mistress. If decided to help the one who was calling for help, by all means. Maybe he's been kidnapped, or else something was going on right now. She quickly picked up her dress and ran into the forest. The girl was running, running for her life. She stepped on a dry branch with her dainty shoe. There was a crack. That dry branch gave her away. Couldn't get in unnoticed. She came to the edge of the forest. Under a tree sat a black-haired young man. There were wounds on his body. Next to him sat a small dragon. Mistress Estelle stopped and watched the scene in progress. The young man's face was smeared. His eyes were closed. All indications were that the boy was not well. Mistress Estelle came closer, but the young man did not react. He sat leaning against a tree, silent. Next to him sat the dragon, whimpering pitifully. Tears were dripping from his eyes. The first thought that arose in Mistress's mind was why the man was in such a place. How did he get here? Why is he unwell? He's in the prince's castle grounds. It was also strange that there was a small dragon sitting next to the boy. Now Lady Estelle realized that it was the dragon that was calling in a child's voice for help. He looked pitifully at the girl once more and asked for help. The girl bent over and wondered if she could get someone to help her. After all, what could she do to help herself? But the dragon begged. He said you can't call a human. If you call a human for help the secret will be revealed. And that can't happen under any circumstances. What do you mean not to be revealed? And what secret is the dragon talking about now? And the girl thought for a moment. At this time the young man began to cough. The girl looked at him carefully. She reached out her hand and wanted to touch him. Mistress Estelle touched the young man's body. Her hand felt as if it were hot. Mistress Estelle realized that the young man's body was on fire. All the symptoms were similar to Duke Alon's overload symptoms. He was also burning himself. His chest was throbbing. And Mistress Estelle had a picture before her eyes as she threw herself on the Duke's neck. She wrapped her arms round the young man's neck and tried with all her might to hold him. If she could use the ability now, it would allow her to save this man. And she looked carefully at her hands. But Estelle didn't know one thing how she could put her powers to work, what she could do to help this man. At this moment, the dragonkin asked the girl, would she not be able to save his master? The dragon looked pitifully at the girl. He thought that the boy who was near him would die. The dragon was even sadder at these words. The girl saw how worried the dragonkin was about this young man. The girl thought for a moment, what she could do to help. She could do it, but she didn't know how. One more look at the young man, the girl decided. By all means, she will save him. She wants to do it. She has to use her powers in some way and she remembered an episode from her life. It was when she asked the Duke of Alad how to use a sword. The Duke looked at the girl carefully. The girl stood thinking that the young man would tell her in detail about each technique, but the Duke only laughed. He was a little worried that she would be disappointed by his answer. Well, Mrs. Estelle looked straight into the Duke's eyes without blinking. There's no definitive concept of how there are no rules. When you're in possession of the ball, you just need instinct. It will tell you which techniques to use. The girl stood and looked at the Duke carefully. She had not expected such an answer and was a little disappointed. At that moment she remembered the Duke's words, instinctively, and she pressed herself against him with her whole body. She wrapped her arms around his neck, and she closed her eyes. His body was very hot. She felt like she was about to be burned, but she kept hugging him in spite of that. It would be dangerous if the temperature rose even higher. It's very important not to let that happen. Mistress Estelle was sure that her power would work and that it would save the boy. She asked her inner voice or her powers to save the young man. A glow seemed to shine from behind her. Mistress Estelle saw this glow around her. Suddenly the lad opened his eyes. The girl realized that the young man had woken up, for he had turned slightly away from the tree. His eyes were still closed. The dragon flew up to the boy and waited for him to come to his senses. Drops of sweat appeared on the young man's face. He opened his mouth and breathed heavily. Mrs. Estelle was a little upset. She thought he was getting better and woke up. The boy still showed no signs of life. Estelle said that as expected it was necessary to call someone for help. But suddenly the young man's hand went round the girl's arm. Night had descended on the kingdom. A month was visible in the sky. Your kingdom was glowing because it was having a birthday party. Suddenly the young man opened his eyes. His eyes were of a golden color. And in them Mrs. Estelle saw her reflection. She was surprised to see the boy awake. It turned out that she had succeeded. The young man continued to hold the girl's hand. He looked carefully into her eyes. Could it be that she had saved him now? Dragonfly flew above them and watched them. Suddenly the young man started coughing. Blood flew from his mouth. The girl was very surprised. She asked if the young man was all right. The young man covered himself with his hand. He said he was perfectly fine now. The young man wanted to add something else, but he didn't have time. The dragon swiftly flew up to him and threw himself on his neck with shouts of hurrah. He was glad that the young man was not dead. 
It was a great happiness for the dragon. He really believed that the young man was about to die. Tears and joy flowed from the dragon's eyes. Mistress Estelle looked at the young man carefully. The situation was urgent, so she helped him without hesitation. But on second thought, right now he's lying with such a wound in the Imperial Palace. Well, the girl decided she'd better stay out of it. It was none of her business what he was doing here or what happened to him. Mistress, you were about to leave. But the young man called out to her and she turned round. The young man asked the girl, had she now cured him? Estelle looked carefully into his eyes. She did not know what to say to him. She could not tell him all her secrets, and she hesitated to answer. The girl wondered, could this man? He has black hair and golden eyes. He also has a dragon with him at all times. It's like they're inseparable. That was right. This girl made Claude a better person. Estelle watched the young man play with the dragon. As expected, this young man is the main character in the world of the novel, and his name is Claude Carlstein. He didn't seem to be a bad person either, but it seemed she'd heard that for the sake of great status, he didn't care about good or bad. The girl was a little disappointed. She would stay alive thanks to the main character's buff and that was it. The girl quickly straightened her arms. She told the young man that he looked much better now, so she was calm for him. When she first saw him, she was very worried. But after she helped him, Estelle was completely calm. The young man was already on his feet. He reiterated that he was perfectly fine. There was no need to worry about him. However, the young man was very curious to know how she was able to heal him. The girl thought again. What is her answer now? She can't reveal all the cards. She can't say that I used Mercedes's power to heal her. Racket, it's a family, which has been suffering from serious symptoms of overload for generations. Obviously, to Claude, the current Grand Duke of the Crown, she would look like a good first aid kit because she has the power of a Mercedes. Perhaps she would be taken advantage of. After a little thought, Estelle answered. She had learned how to use calming magic. Mrs. Estelle spoke as convincingly as possible. Claude mustn't realize it was a lie, and it seemed to work. The dragonkin was delighted. That magic really worked on him, then wasn't the benefactor a legendary tamer from your magic school. And the young man really believed that the girl could really be from the school of magic. And Mrs. Estelle shouted out, No, she isn't. She's not that excellent a wizard. It's just a hobby of hers. She teaches the basics of magic as a hobby. Well, you could tell from the young man's tone that he didn't believe her word at all. The young man decided to reward the girl. But she raised her hand and said she shouldn't. It's all right. Good deeds don't pay. It was very embarrassing to the young man that the girl constantly and stubbornly refused. Claude looked once more into the girl's sky-blue eyes. He'd forgotten and the distance came even closer. He stared into her eyes. He wanted to say something, but suddenly he was speechless. He just stood there and watched. The young man was handsome in his own right. Mistress Estelle must have captivated him with her beauty. The young man's scornful gaze made her cheeks blush. The young man was surprised when he said that she knew who he was. It was strange because Estelle hadn't said that. Her eyes widened even more, with a little dare. The girl asked what he was talking about. At that moment, the girl and the young man, as well as the dragon sitting on his shoulder, heard someone swearing, and the sound came from behind the trees. Everything indicated that the crown prince was behind the trees. He shouted angrily, where the hell is this daughter hiding? The prince's face was very angry, and the girl had never seen the crown prince before. And this was not how she had imagined him at all. But it was him, and he was standing not far from the mistress. The interlocutor apologized to his majesty. Mistress Estelle knew it was wrong to eavesdrop on other people's conversations, but there was nothing she could do about it. After all, the conversation was apparently about her. The man bent over saying that she could not go outside the palace. Several guards stood beside the prince. The prince's interlocutor was her father. This was the man she had spent her entire life thinking of as her father, and a few days ago she learnt that he was not. The man replied that the Valois family carriage was still here. Mrs. Estelle was very surprised to see her father here. What business could he have with the prince? What kind of conversation is this? And what is going on here anyway? They continued to chat not far from where Mistress Estelle stood and the young man she had rescued. The girl looked at her father once more. She didn't understand why her father... At this point the flying around suggested, maybe they'd better hide and not give themselves away. The dragon quickly flew around the girl and the boy. It started to glow in an incomprehensible way. Mistress Estelle was very surprised. Could it be that the magic of illusion is now in effect? With this method the girls and boys managed to hide themselves. Mistress Estelle could not do otherwise, and she continued to listen to the conversation. The prince asked his father, hadn't he brought up this girl as his daughter all these fifteen years? The prince asked the father himself to think. How could his daughter be at the ball? The father stood confused. He hadn't invited her here. And she wasn't traveling here with her family. She was traveling here with other people. So the father could give no answer. The father knew. It was probably the prince who had encouraged the girl to attend the ball. If no one knew she was from the Mercedes family, no one would have invited her here. 
basically asked his father to do his best, and if all went well he would be related to the royal family. It was a very tempting offer for Count Brienne. Mistress Estelle heard those words. He will become a relative. What does that mean? Would she have to marry this prince, but that's impossible. Father bowed low to the prince. He said well and added that he would definitely try his best. By all means he would find his daughter Estelle. The prince was very angry. You could tell by the expression in his eyes. They seemed to glow with a red light. The prince made one condition to his father. Mistress Estelle must be found tonight. Dad was stunned. This is a very short period of time. The man was afraid he would fail, but he could not cross the principal. Mrs. Estelle clutched at her heart. Something stabbed in her chest. The daughter they were talking about was not Celia. The prince and her father were talking about her. Estelle's. But she didn't understand one thing. Why the prince wanted her. Why he would ask her father to look for her. And why the urgency. Something was wrong. The father told the prince that he would go and find the girl himself. The prince needed to send a man away. But at that moment one of the men ran up to the prince and addressed him. The prince turned round and asked the young man what had happened. The man was out of breath because he was in a hurry. The man could not immediately find the right words. And the prince did not like to wait. He demanded to be told quickly what had happened. The man took a little breath and began his story. He was trying to tell the prince about some landmark of theirs. Specifically, about the fifth egg. The fifth egg had been stolen. This news made the prince very angry. He clenched his fists and began to shout. He could not believe that the egg had been stolen. The fifth egg had the strongest defense of the guardian group. This just wasn't supposed to happen. Who could get through them and take it? How is that even possible? After that, the mistress looked at Claude carefully, and also at that dragon that was sitting on his shoulder. The girl guessed. He was probably the one who stole the egg, and the dragonkin that sat on his shoulder most likely knew it too. The dragon cub snuggled up to his master. He said it all sounds like fun. But what's weird is that they're the ones who had the egg stolen from them. And the dragon just took his back. And the prince says it was stolen. Mrs. Estelle looked at Claude once more. It seems that she has met an enemy. But his scars are exactly the same as Li Hua Xiong's. After some thought, the girl decided that the only right thing to do was to stay out of it. After all, she doesn't know all the information. And when you don't know all the information, it's hard to judge. You can make false assumptions. The prince ordered all the guards who were on duty today to be called. He ordered them all to be severely punished. The prince was very angry. The guards obediently lined up in front of him. The prince ordered the entire palace to be searched immediately. He ordered every corner to be searched. They couldn't have got far. If the defenses had been removed, the thief would be in trouble. The guards understood the prince's orders. The prince looked round and turned to Count Brienne. He said that if a man wanted to live, he must pretend that nothing had happened. The man understood. He agreed with the prince. And he was willing to do whatever he asked him to do. His majesty must not be allowed to know that it's missing. A little time passed. Mistress dared to ask Claude a question. She wanted to know if all these people were looking for him. She wanted him to confirm it, if she thought she was right. Claude didn't deny it, and all the guards were looking for him. He took this egg, and the dragon sat on his shoulder and watched intently. Mrs. Estelle asked Claude's mind, What will he do now? How will he get out of the palace? After all, everyone is looking for him now. Claude thought the girl would be more determined. Well, all indications were that she was a little worried. The girl knew that if he was caught, she would be accused of complicity. It was right. The girl was right. And Claude put his hand to his chin and thought, what to do next? After a little thought, he said, he asked the girl not to worry. He was ready to take her to the safe place. The girl asked. He was ready to take her to the safe place right now or later. With the crown prince's guard searching everything so quickly, the girl looked in the direction where the rustling had come from. The guards had already started searching. The girl wondered where Claude wanted to hide her. After all, the guards were not far from them. They were about to find them. And what would happen next could only be guessed. Claude asked if she wanted to go out. The young man was calm. He didn't look like a villain at all. Estelle's inner voice told her that the young man was kind. The girl said she wanted to go to the ballroom. She was wearing an open dress and was a little cold. The young man Milo smiled. He stepped closer to the girl. And he said no problem. He put his right hand to his chest. Specifically who in the area where the heart is located. And suddenly a miracle happened. The young man was reincarnated. He was very hard to recognize. He became a completely different person. The girl opened her mouth in surprise. In front of her stood a fair-haired young man, wearing a beautiful tailcoat. His hair was medium length and laws in the back. His eyes were no longer golden but violet. Dragon said that Claude had really scared him. Dragon asked him to warn him when he was reincarnating, and the young man held out his hand to the girl. She stood there with her mouth open. She couldn't say anything. The young man apologized. Without words, it was clear that Mrs. Estelle was surprised. Well, there she put her hand on Claude's arm, and they walked quickly towards the castle. A guard blocked their way a little further away. Claude behaved calmly. 
Mrs. Estelle was a little nervous. The guard said hello. He apologized and asked for his name. Since everyone in the kingdom was looking for the thief, the guards had to check every guest present. Claude replied that his name was Jean Lambert, over the young man's shoulder. The guard begged his pardon and allowed Baron Lambert to pass. The sentinel, as they moved away from the guard mistress and now thought, you could tell by the action that the man called Jean Lambert was very famous. Anyway, I'm glad they got through so easily. The girl was walking and had her hand covering her medallion. Claude noticed it. He didn't look directly at the girl, but he kept watching her with a sidelong glance. And then they came to the castle. The castle was glowing. Even though it was already night, none of the people present were about to leave. Claude offered to escort the girl inside. Mrs. Estelle politely declined. She said that she would go further on her own. The girl asked Claude to heal when she had time to do so. Claude leaned over to the girl and said, Since everything was already in order, maybe she would finally tell him her name. They had known each other for over an hour. And he still didn't know the girl's name. Claude's eyes were now rose-colored. He had a very charming smile. He wanted to know the name of his savior. Mrs. Estelle was confused. She could not find the right words. She could not reveal her true name. Here she thought for a moment and decided to speak. Her hands were folded. If you looked closely, you could see that the girl was about to lie. She said her name was Sibel. The young man said well. He stood and looked into her blue eyes. He just couldn't take his eyes off them. The young man said that he would remember her, Mrs. Sibel. The young man said that he would remember her, Mrs. Sibel. But the young man had not yet said everything. He would not like to say such things to his savior. But he leaned over and said quietly, It would be better that no one should know but their meeting. Let it remain only in the memory of Claude and Mrs. Sibel. Mrs. Estelle was in agreement with Claude's words. She herself was not going to tell anyone about this meeting. The young man looked at the girl carefully. She was not like the others. He had never met a girl like her before. Claude told Estelle that she was special. Money or compensation for her deed. She doesn't know who he is. The girl was a little amused by that. She didn't know who he was. Honestly, honestly, and in fact she had guessed who he was a long time ago. She just kept it carefully hidden. The fetus says it's okay. He doesn't want to doubt the savior. He asked the girl to be attentive. The young man and the girl bowed to each other. Claude turned round and started to walk away. If stood cross-legged and stared at the young man. A lot of strange things had happened that evening. Estelle was happy that Claude didn't recognize that she was from the Mercedes family. It was a very good thing. A few more seconds and the clock would have shown midnight. The Valois brothers were sitting on the sofa. They seemed to be very worried about Estelle and their father. Duke Lloyd said it was too late. I can't believe it's taking so long. It's after midnight. Duke Alon said, Rumor has it a lot of dirty boys are out to get someone like her. He was cursing. I mean, he should have gone with her. Enner joined the conversation. He told his brothers that they couldn't know how the ball was going. Also, they don't even know how many of these guys are there. Alond was angry. He saw how many invitations there were. There were a large number of them. Ennard said that their father went with Mrs. Estelle, so they needn't worry. He will definitely be able to protect the girl. At that moment, the brothers heard the carriage drive up. The Duke rushed quickly to the window. The door slowly opened. Duke Clement Valois and Mistress Estelle entered the room. Duke Lloyd was overjoyed. He was glad that they had returned. The young man also asked how they had spent their time with Mistress Estelle. The girl was surprised that the brothers were still awake. She realized that they were very worried and had no time to sleep. Duke Along laughed. He just couldn't sleep while she still hadn't come home yet. Honestly, he admitted that his brother scolded him for worrying. There was a backgrounder behind him. He was silent. Clement Valois said that Mistress Estelle had a hard time today, but she stood the test with dignity. She held herself with courage and dignity. Dad really wanted to tell her how she had suddenly escaped from the balcony, but he decided it wasn't the right time, so he put it off till later. Mrs. Estelle laughed. Duke Lloyd said he would have to go to the temple tomorrow. Estelle asked why he was going to the temple. Duke Lloyd said there was some news. People were saying that the high priest had come to the island. Estelle listened attentively to Duke Lloyd. She knew that the only person who could help her with her illness was the high priest. Mistress Estelle was sitting in her room in front of the mirror. There were two maids beside her. One of them was busy combing her gorgeous hair. The girl sat on a chair looking in the mirror and thinking about her own. She was already exhausted from the morning because she was looking for an excuse for the Duke because of what happened last night. She couldn't get that guy out of her head. His name was Claude Carlstein. Meeting that man was really unexpected. She never would have thought that this could happen when the main character and the protagonist meet for the first time. She never imagined she'd be there. And she remembered the scene when the young man took her hand and woke up. I guess she met him before Celia did, because everything went wrong, but she's not going to see him again. Would she? She wanted to hear the answer to that question. The Duke seemed to realize it too. It seemed to her as if there was something outside. She didn't want to bother these people, who were already helping her a lot. They're all confident. Showed her what caring is all about. At this time, the maid said she was very nervous. 
The girl pushed all her thoughts away and looked at the maid carefully. Audrey stood and looked at Estelle attentively. The maids realized that the girl was very anxious about going to the temple, but they asked her not to worry too much. She won't be going there alone. She will be accompanied to the temple by Duke Ennard. Rain, who is very good at swordsmanship, will also be by her side. The maid bowed politely. She thought that these words would put their mistress at ease. That's right. The Valois family called for the priest, and Mrs. Estelle thanked the maids. Audrey assured Estelle. The high priest would obviously say something different from the past priest. There is always hope that the disease will recede, and a complete cure will come. Mrs. Estelle didn't really believe it. She just didn't know. Some kind of hope lived in her head after all. And she remembered her parents. Would it be easy to fix the fact that she had gone to the temple many times since she was a child to cure the white sickness? Well, she was left unattended without ever being cured. And she remembered being a little girl. Her parents would bring her to the temple and leave her there. They didn't care how she felt. Mistress Estelle returned to her memories for a few seconds. And so the morning came. Mistress Estelle, Duke Ennard, and the girl Rain stood outside the palace. Duke Ennard looked around. Everything was quiet. All indications were that the news of the priest's arrival had not yet spread. And behold, men dressed in white approached them. These men were from the temple. The temple attendants greeted the Duke of Valois, and they did not know the names of the girls who stood next to the Duke. Mrs. Estelle looked at these people carefully and said hello too. Today she was wearing a hat. The servants of the temple invited the girl to go with them. The priest is already waiting for them. When they entered the temple, the priest in white robes stood with his back to those present. He was dressed in a white robe, and on his head was a hood. The garment was embroidered with gold. Duke Ennard and Mistress Estelle entered the temple. The girl was visibly worried. The priest turned round. All indications were that it was a girl. She had long blonde hair. The priest greeted Mrs. Mercedes and also the Duke of Valois. The girl smiled sweetly, and everyone saw her face. Her hair was neatly arranged in a braid. Mrs. Estelle was a little shocked. Could this man be the priest of the continent? The priest moved closer to the girl and decided to examine her. She reached out and took the girl's head. She looked carefully into her eyes. For a moment, the priest thought for a moment. The priest said the girl must have suffered a lot, and she was very sorry. Duke Ennard stood a little further away and listened to every word. He felt sorry for the girl. Mrs. Estelle said that when she was a little girl, she often had a fever, after which her body temperature rose. But now she's fine. The girl thought for a moment. She remembered the words that the disease would slowly progress. It was only a silent death. But the priestess was smiling. She was very calm. The girl suggested that Mistress Estelle lie down. The girl lay on the table on her back. Duke Ennard had been present in the temple all this time. He watched the girl and also observed every action of the priest. At first everyone thought she was possessed, and watching the process made him worry about her. The priest was doing some kind of manipulation. Lalala clenched her fists. The priest was carrying out some kind of manipulation with her hand. At this moment, the priest's hand seemed to shine. It was to the point where Duke Ennard, without even hesitating, was willing to pay a rather large price. That was why his second brother would be hunting creatures on the western border for a while. The priest closed her eyes. She mumbled something to herself. She said it was all right and she understood. After this, the priest helped the girl to stand up. She said that the white sickness largely divides progress into first, second, and third stages. Naturally, the less progressive the disease, the easier it is to treat. The girl listened attentively to every word of the priest. Not once did she mention that the girl was slowly dying, and so there was hope for recovery. The priestess said that Mrs. Estelle is now in the third stage. The girl was a little upset. It was just as I expected. She knew that patients with white disease are sentenced to a limited period of time. If all goes well, that's three years, and it doesn't matter what kind of priest you get. That's the limit. Suddenly, Duke Ennard jumped up from his seat. He once again questioned what the Holy Father was talking about. Did she really think they had come here to hear this? All of this they have heard for a long time. What they want is a real result. The excited Duke called out to Estelle. He knew that priests had no powers, but the priest turned again to Mistress Estelle, and the girls looked at her hopefully. The priest said it would probably be possible with her power, and she bowed. The girl was stunned. Could it really be possible? Tears came to Estelle's eyes. The girl did not believe the words that were spoken. She started wiping those tears with her hands. The priest suggested that from tomorrow they start the treatment. Estelle was just happy. She was just radiant. She was ready to start her treatment by tomorrow. She also thanked the Holy Father. Duke Ennard stood aside and eyed the situation suspiciously. He didn't quite believe the priest. After a little thought, the priest asked, Had the girl met the Archduke of Karlstein? Mrs. Estelle had not expected such a question. At this time, Duke Ennard jumped up. He shouted out, Why should he see Estelle? Was it because Estelle had inherited Mercedes's blood? At this time, Madame sat silent. She was surprised that the priestess found out about it, though no one had told her about it. That was right. 
Archduke Claude's overload probably goes the worst. But Duke Ennard was angry. He said he would never allow it, especially not to that boy. Mistress Estelle didn't understand this behavior of Mr. Ennard, why he was so angry with Claude. He probably had his own accounts with him, the priest said. There must be some preface here. But for the moment he understood everything, and what is being treated here must be kept secret from the Archduke. Lately the priestess has been specifically treating Archduke Claude. Duke Ennard didn't expect to hear such a thing. He directly began to shake with anger. He didn't expect Claude to be here either. The Duke turned away. He asked Estelle to leave. He needed to take countermeasures to keep Claude from hanging around. But the girl didn't understand the Duke's behavior. What kind of relationship they had. Ennard went to the exit. The girl looked alternately at the priest and the Duke. The priest said she would see you tomorrow. She said goodbye to Mrs. Estelle. The girl followed the angry Duke Ennard. And the priest waved her hand after the girl. Now the three of them were leaving, I have to tell my father. Mrs. Estelle knew that Carlstein's main mission was to find her, and he had almost fulfilled that mission. Only he didn't find her, she found him, and she saved him from death. But the Erg Duke is about to have the real cure. Celia, she's the girl who's the Brian family's birth daughter. All three of them had already left the temple. There was a man standing behind a pillar outside the temple. He was wearing a black cloak. On his way out, Duke Ennard immediately noticed the man's presence. It seemed suspicious to him. The man removed his hood at this point. Duke Ennard has seen this face before. This man is a member of the Karanka Guild. Hertzies turned to the girl. He said home, and he would be away for a while. Mistress Estelle tried to ask where the Duke was going. Well, the Duke just smiled sweetly. He said he had somewhere to be. The Duke slowly moved away from the girls, and Mistress Estelle and Rain stood on the threshold of the temple. Rain hurried to reassure Lady Estelle. She said that apparently the Duke had some urgent business to attend to. She helped the lady put on her hat and suggested she go home. At that moment, something caught Mistress's attention. She's looking somewhere else. That the girl at this moment could not hear her at all, because all of Mistress's appeals were to no avail. The girl looked at the balcony. There were some people standing there. One of the women looked familiar to her. She couldn't mistake this woman. In the center stood Countess Lorelia Brienne. It was her mother. The women were walking and discussing something cheerfully. Mrs. Estelle stood looking at her mother carefully. She had not expected to see her here at all. At that moment, the mother saw Mistress Estelle. They met her eyes. Mother was surprised. She just froze in place. She suddenly stopped talking. A traveling companion who was next to her asked what had happened to her, but it was as if the mother did not hear what was addressed to her. She saw her former daughter Estelle. She was speechless. Mistress and looked at her mother carefully. The girl was calm. Mother's traveling companions began to discuss something amongst themselves. Estelle. Mistress Estelle approached her mother slowly. As she walked, she thought, what she should call her now. Mistress Estelle came closer to her mother and said hello. She addressed her as Countess Brienne, after they got in. The girl just couldn't call her mother. The Countess was very much surprised. Had she really said Countess Brienne? She had never called her that before. The woman grabbed her head and laughed loudly. Why the Countess started laughing hysterically, the girl did not understand. Doesn't she even consider her a mother now? The Countess was annoyed. At this moment, everyone present in the square began to whisper. The Countess saw the people behind her begin to whisper. It was not pleasant for her, but it was all true. The first time she heard the news, she thought the world was going mad. The Countess asked Estelle to come clean. Since when did she know she would be the heiress? But the girl did not understand what the Countess was saying. She stood and listened to her in silence. The Countess was angry. She was angry with the girl because she didn't even thank them for their upbringing. She was just waiting for the day when she could slap them in the face. She didn't know that the girl only found out about her abilities after she was kicked out of the house. Miss Rain shadowed Mistress Estelle with her. She told the Countess that she was standing very close. The Countess did not expect this turn of events. She was used to humiliating her daughter. And at this moment, she had her defenders. And it was unusual. The Countess raised her hand and screamed, How dare the maid speak to her? At this point, Mistress Estelle couldn't take it anymore. And she just screamed to stop it. She jumped out from behind Rhina and covered her with her body for the enraged countess wanted to hit the girl. Mistress shouted that it was her man. You shouldn't call her a servant, let alone touch her. The countess has no right to treat people like that. The countess was surprised. Could it be that Esther was now contradicting her? But the girl was determined. She took the hand of Rain, who was standing behind her. The girl apologized and said they had to go. Mistress had nothing more to talk to the countess about. They turned round and walked quickly away. The countess was furious. She thought Estelle would stop. But Estelle walked slowly away. The countess was very angry. She bit her lip in resentment, and despite the countess calling loudly for Estelle, the girl didn't stop and walked away quickly. She kept pulling Rhine's hand behind her. The girl was very surprised at this meeting. She would not like to see her mother, and after the words, she very quickly wanted to get as far away as possible. 
and she remembered her mother abusing her, how she asked who your mother was, how she was disgusted to talk to her, how she screamed in rage that she had to wash her hands after touching her daughter. Estelle had a very hard time at times like this. Here Rain ran her hand gently through her hair. She said in Mistress Estelle's ear that her hand was gripping Rain's arm so tightly that she could barely feel it anymore. At that moment, the mistress came to her senses. She quickly let go of the girl's hand. Estelle quickly apologized to Rain. She said that she had arbitrarily taken her hand. At Rain said that she shouldn't be so surprised. Nothing terrible had happened after all. But the girl didn't stop. Also asked her to forgive her for calling Rain her human. Even though the girl is a human of the duchy, she had no right to say that. But the market was calm. She said that she is not only a person of the duchy, but her person too. She is accompanying her on the duke's orders. Therefore, there is no need for the girl to apologize at all. Estelle calmed down a little, looked into Rain's eyes. She thanked the girl for her words. She was very pleased to hear it. The events took place in the duchy. When Mistress Estelle returned to the duchy, the maids and servants began to ask how she was, what she had heard from the priest. They were all really curious to know this information. Rain tried to keep her distance around Estelle as well. Everyone was wondering if the priest would be able to help the girl. I hadn't expected such interest from the servants. She said the priest would try to cure her. He said he couldn't guarantee a full recovery. And those words that the priest would at least try to do it already gave the girl hope. The girl heard shouts of delight. All the servants were happy that the girl could be cured. They were very worried about her. The servants supported Estelle. They said that the priest would surely cure her. Is there any disease that a priest can't cure? Audrey's maid held Estelle's hand. And for her it was a great relief. Tears were visible in the service's eyes. Estelle was surprised. All the boys were so... One of the servants said that this information should be told to the Lord and Master sooner rather than later. The butler intervened in the conversation. He said he would. After all, Madam has no time for that now. She was very tired from the journey and needed to rest. Mistress began to laugh merrily. It was the first time she had such a happy and ringing laugh. She was happy with the attitude of the people around her. The girl had never felt this way before. At this time in the Pancake County, the Count pounded his fist on the table menacingly. He shouted at his wife that she was out of her mind. How could she raise her voice to Estelle in public? They should never do that. But the woman stood her ground. She claimed it was the girl who had been insolent with her. She didn't even thank her for bringing her up. The countess thought the girl would fall at her feet and thank her. Well, the girl had her pride. Count Brienne was upset. He got up from the table. They couldn't find her at the ball with the guards. Well, as soon as she met her, she humiliated her in front of everyone. After all, he said, he warned the countess. In order for them to apply for the cancellation of the family register, it must be proved that we were a peaceful family with her. Thorelia Brienne said the Earl says that because he didn't see her then. She had lustrous hair, lively blue eyes, and her clothes were very luxurious. Her clothes were more luxurious than Lorelei Brienne herself wore. And the woman just had a feeling of envy. If they had left that white ghost for a few more days, Mercedes's family would have been ours. But they threw the girl out on the street. And that's a significant disadvantage. The Count of Brienne said they could at least hold on to the thread. But now there is no other choice but to plead with the Crown Prince, therefore the matter. Next to the Count sat the girl Celia. She was drinking flavored tea. She asked her father not to worry. The girl asked to leave everything as it was. She promised to bring her back herself. Celia felt responsible too. She was kicked out of the house because of her. If she hadn't come, the girl would have received the parcel while she was in the house. But Lorelia Brienne was against it. She shook her head emphatically. The Countess grabbed her hand. She is their true blood, after all. There's no way a white ghost like her could be their child. It was definitely Estelle's plan. It was her clever ruse. The Countess asked Celia not to feel remorse. Celia thanked her mother for her understanding. Celia said the Count and Countess wouldn't have to worry, even if the middle is a little different, what the daughter wants to say. Celia said the ending of the story should be the same, and the girl laughed merrily. Mistress Esther and her maid Audrey were walking down the corridor. Audrey reminded her mistress that the treatment starts tomorrow. She asked if she was nervous. Mrs. Estelle said she was going for a night walk for a reason. She can't sleep. She's probably really worried. The servant said it's inevitable, and excitement before treatment is normal. It was only a matter of getting up healthy. And the maid clenched her fists tightly. Lord decided that Audrey was going for a walk with her too, and they walked down the corridor together. Attention, one of the portraits that hung on the wall. On the wall hung a portrait of a girl. She was very beautiful in herself. She had long yellow hot hair. Mrs. Esther was delighted. It was cool. Audrey realized from the expression on Mistress Audrey's face that it was the first time Estelle had seen the portrait. They looked at the portrait together once more. Audrey told. While Mrs. Estelle was at the temple, Lady Sabelle's portrait was finished and they hung it on the wall. Then that man, and Mrs. Estelle was silent for a moment. A manly warrior appeared before the girl's eyes. Curls laughed merrily. Yes, he is the youngest knight, Princess Sabelle. 
and the maid told her that she was now trying to subdue the creatures on the border, but that she sometimes returned to the duchy, so the girls would have to see each other soon. So they came to the door and opened it. A very cold air came in from the door. Mrs. Estelle was suddenly cold. She wrapped her arms around herself in the hope of getting warm. The servant said it must be a little chilly at night, even though it was warm outside during the day. So the maid suggested that Mrs. Estelle bring a shawl. The girl was very grateful to Audrey for the offer. After all, she would definitely freeze on the walk. She turned round quickly and went into the house to fetch her shawl, and Mrs. Estelle stayed outside. It was so cold outside that the girl's mouth was steaming. Estelle decided it would be better for her to wait for the maid inside, until she returned. Well, at that moment, the girl heard someone talking. She quietly moved closer. She looked carefully at those who were talking. Two men were talking. One of them said that Archduke Claude had turned up here. The girl was surprised to hear about the deck, so she quickly looked out from behind the tree. Duke Clement of Valois and his son Duke Ennard were talking. The son told them that Claude goes into hiding whenever he has symptoms. But why on earth would he leave his land and sneak into the capital of another empire? Watching and listening to the conversation, as I did with the temple. Why does Ennard hate Claude so much? Could it be that man in the temple too? Come to think of it, they seem to fight all the time in the novel. All the fights were about Celia. Ennard asked his father about what had happened at the last imperial ball. Clement Valois hesitated for a moment. He didn't know exactly, but he heard that the crown prince used a personal soldier to search the palace throughout the day. Mistress Estelle isn't involved in this, so there's no need to worry. Estelle was dazed behind the tree. She did not want to hear this conversation, but she stood and would not listen. Her conscience tormented she couldn't be here any longer. It's not polite to eavesdrop. Ennard wanted to tell his father something tomorrow. Why don't they put a strong guard on her so that that guy can never get near her? Estelle was dumbfounded. Clement Valois thought for a moment. To protect the girl from Claude. And they would need to introduce more than a dozen guards to her. Or you could give her an artifact and have her carry it around with her at all times. Estelle was surprised. In such a peaceful place like this, even the queen didn't have so many guards. And she would be presented with such guards to protect her from Claude. She didn't consider him dangerous at all. She was also confused by the word artifact. What the hell is that? At that time a maid approached Estelle. She was carrying a warm shawl. The girl quickly turned away and told the maid to be quiet. The maid asked in a quiet voice what was wrong. Estelle quickly picked up her shawl and suggested we go to the glass garden. She knew it was especially nice at night. The next day in the duchy came. Estelle was ready to go to the temple. She approached the maid. The girl bowed politely. She was happy. Today had finally come. She had been waiting for it for so long. Her treatment will begin very soon. That can't be good. Esther walked into the dining room and said good morning to everyone. In the dining room was Duke Lloyd and Ennard. Also standing beside him with a newspaper in his hands was the butler. The girl gasped in surprise, snatched the newspaper out of the butler's hands. He quickly tossed it on the chair. You could tell the man was upset. If he asked to see it, after all it had already happened. Mistress to the butler. She asked him what was wrong. The butler silently handed her a newspaper. He said he thought she should see it. Estelle quickly picked up the newspaper and ran through the contents. She couldn't believe her eyes. Her eyes rounded with surprise. Estelle Mermades, who alone became the heiress to the most prestigious empire. There was also information about her childhood. When she was Estelle, there was a picture of her father and mother's happy family in the paper. The girl was surprised. What it was. Not so long ago, her family had shunned her. And now to put happy pictures of the family in the newspaper. Countess Lorelei was asked, did she know that the girl was not her own child? What parents would live with such terrible doubts? According to Lorelia, they had simply raised Estelle with love. For a long time, they thought there was something extraordinary about her. Unlike them, her parents, she had grown up beautiful from childhood and had apparently learnt the imperial language. Estelle was dumbfounded. She stared at the paper and couldn't believe it. Everything that was written was a blatant lie. The girl touched the picture depicted in the newspaper with her hand. At that moment, the girl laughed loudly. She remembered the angry faces of her parents who raised her. The article that was written in the newspaper was a lie. From the beginning to the end, it was a lie. At this time, Duke Ennard sprang towards the butler. He snatched the paper out of the butler's hands. He was very curious to know what it said. The young man quickly opened the paper and began to read. Mrs. Estelle also continued to read the newspaper. At that time, Duke Ennard had already read the article to the end. He quickly tossed the paper. The young man was enraged. Why then did the parents remain silent about the one who left their child to die in winter? Does it treat Russia with love? Duke Ennard asked Estelle to go with him. The girl had not expected this from the young man. The article made him visibly angry. The Duke decided to go and no matter where to the newspaper publishers who printed the article or to the county of Brienne. He was going to go there and ask them how dare they ridicule her in articles like this. But it seems Estelle didn't quite agree with the young man. In her hand, she clutched a newspaper with an article in it. 
and the girl thought for a moment. She was no longer indebted to the Valois family. At this moment, Mistress Estelle was addressed by the Duke of Lloyd. He looked at the girl carefully and said, The former parents plan to sue. Everyone stood and remained silent. At these words, Mrs. Estelle's newspaper fell out of her hands. The girl was stunned to hear the news, what her former parents were up to, why they decided to do this to her. They decided to go to court. Mistress Estelle stood looking at the dukes in confusion. She didn't know what to say to her, nor did she know what she could do. But Duke Ennard confirmed what her former parents were up to. The girl apologized and asked what lawsuit we were talking about. There's a family support law in the Empire. And Duke Lloyd asked the girl if she knew about it. The Family Support Act was enacted so that children could not carelessly abandon their elderly parents. If it is recognized that the parents cared for and nurtured their child, the child will not be able to stop communicating with their parents even when they become adults, the girl inquired. Did the Duke and want to say she couldn't break off the relationship, even though the Countess had abandoned her first? Lloyd said, unless they could prove they hadn't fulfilled their parental duties. Estelle repeated Lloyd's last words once more. Duties. Obviously the Countess didn't starve her. There were more occasions when she had not eaten properly, but it was not enough to starve her to death. It was true that she, who had white sickness, was raised in the attic. But there was one thing. Just because food, clothing, and shelter have been managed doesn't mean they have fulfilled their parental responsibilities. When her parents treated her so cruelly, the servants went even further, spitting and hurling harsh words at her. I'm sure everyone in Brienne County, they'll perjure themselves. She's the only one who can prove it. At that moment, an Ennard approached the girl. He asked her what she had been thinking about for so long. Her parents had abandoned her in the middle of winter. Hadn't these things been said? Is there any more proof needed? Lloyd confirms that of course it's true, but he doesn't think the girl's parents don't know that. They know it all too well, and they're thinking every step of the way. So they try to pretend it didn't happen that night. The truth is absolutely not. After all, they could fudge the facts as much as they wanted. Estelle was simply stunned. She didn't know what to say. It was the first time she had ever been in such a situation but the girl must have already thought of something. Lloyd said that was right. The girl's parents decided to fight public opinion. If you initially impress people with fake interviews, it will be much easier to submit false waxes later on. It turns out this article is the foundation for putting Esther in front of a judge. It was right. Everyone understood that. The only thing unclear was what the girls should do now. Well, that was to be expected. If they'd delayed it a few more days, you'd get the dragon's tears without a fuss, as if fate had taken her away from home at that moment, as if it were meant to be. Someone called out to Mistress Estelle. It was Duke Lloyd calling her. He asked the girl if she remembered when his father said he would sponsor her. It was not only about material support. The Dukes couldn't let the girl deal with these problems alone. Ennard asked to wait for a while. First, they should meet with the editors and see what the press could do. Lloyd asked his brother not to act rashly. He said that the best option would be for Mistress Estelle to decide for herself whether to accept or accept help from Valois. But Lloyd could guarantee that the Valois could give Mistress Estelle the help she needed. The girl looked at the dukes carefully. They were practically strangers, and they were so desperate to protect and support her. They couldn't just tell her to wait a year until they figured it out themselves. And what's the catch going round and round? And if it's a chopping block, the girl will say she doesn't mind helping. These were all thoughts swirling around in the duke's head. Estelle stood with her head bowed. She thanked everyone present for those words, but there was one, but she needs a little more time to think. She needs to think things through. What is the right thing to do? Whether to accept the Valois support or refuse it? Duke Catcher said he wouldn't push it, but he'll have to hurry up the timing of the meal. After all, today is Temple Healing Day. And the girl shrieked. All this news had completely clouded her mind. She had forgotten that today was the day she would go to the temple for treatment. And Esther ran quickly to her chair. She had to eat very quickly and go to the temple. Duke Lloyd watched the girl carefully. He couldn't believe that her parents had decided to write such a brazen lie in the article. If word of this got out, the Earl's prestige as an Earl and his wife would fall to the ground. It wasn't as if they didn't realize it. Sitting there, I was deep in thought. Had they done it out of simple greed with no thought of any defeat? Lloyd began tapping his finger on the table. They had an ace in their pocket. Duke Lloyd called the young man to him with a gesture of his hand. He asked if he had said anything to Count Ravioli. The young man confirmed that he was talking about this count. Count Ravioli had owned Pavlogium for two generations. Duke Lloyd asked for a private meeting. At this time, a meal was in progress at the table. The Duke sat beside Estelle. He asked the girl if she could not cut normally. The girl did not understand what normal meant. She started to cut as she could and asked if she was doing it right. The carriage was traveling through the city towards the temple. The girl sat in the carriage. Her mind was filled with the information she had learnt in the morning. The family support law was on her mind. The girl didn't think life would be so monotonous, but she didn't expect to be involved in a lawsuit at all. The only thing Estelle wanted to do was find her aunt. 
There was probably some good reason why she didn't turn up herself. She just delivered the family heirloom in a parcel. She really wanted to see her aunt. She may be in danger now. Her aunt's name is Leanna Mercedes. She has lived for such a long time and was completely unaware that she had an aunt. She's the only one who can tell her, and her real mother. At this time, she was approached by a girl, Rain, who was traveling with Mistress Estelle in the carriage. She asked if Mistress was very tired. Ren said they would be here soon. She asked the girl to be patient for a while. Esther said that's not the point at all. Riding in a carriage is not tiring. Suddenly the carriage stopped. They had probably already arrived at their destination. That's right. The girl had so much on her mind that she completely forgot. Here they drove up to the temple. The temple grounds were crowded. The girl was a little embarrassed. I mean, she had a lot of guards assigned to her. They were kind of blocking the girl from people. What to do? In the neighborhood, passers-by whispered. They didn't realize what it was. Probably a girl from some powerful family. People also saw the coat of arms of the Valois family on the carriage. The girl wasn't used to her appearance attracting too much attention. She was confused and covered her face with her hands. But Rain backed her up. She asked Estelle to go with her. The girl Rain looked strangely pleased. Irene and Estelle walked towards the temple. At the back, one of the guards asked someone to stop. It was a girl. And she said she needed to speak to Mrs. Estelle urgently. She looked round for a moment. Celia stood in front of her. She said she was lucky. She hadn't expected to see her so immediately. And the girl smiled sweetly. She asked if Estelle could spare a moment. She looked her carefully in the eyes and called her Mistress Estelle. Celia stood a little further away from Mistress Estelle with two other girls and a young man. The girl was separated from the girl by a guard. Estelle wondered why Celia was here. It was kind of strange of her. In Estelle's mind, that article with the pictures of her family reappeared. Had the Countess sent her as a messenger? The girl walked over and gently took the guard's hand. The young man gasped. She stepped closer to Celia. The girl apologized. She said she had an appointment right now so it would be difficult for her to talk to her. Celia said she's fine. She probably had some business to attend to at the temple. The girl was willing to wait. She was as kind as ever. Celia said she was here to tell Miss Estelle something very important. She asked the girl to be sure to make time for her. She put her hand to her breast. Mistresses remembered the plot that was in the original novel. It was exactly the same plot. Estelle agreed. Told Miss Celia they could talk later. That's because it awakened memories of a past life. I remembered the words and now she's in a supporting role. The girl wasn't sure but she thought she had heard something like this before. And if that was the case, that girl Celia, as expected. And Estelle didn't finish. She needed to be distracted from these thoughts. For now she was lying on a pedestal in the temple. She had come for treatment. And one must think of her recovery. The girl was lying on a pedestal decorated with flowers. A priest stood beside her. The girl looked at the priest. It was as if he wanted to ask Estelle something. The priest admitted that she was keeping out of her private life. She was just curious because her other patient was there that day. The lady didn't understand what the priest was talking about now. What a different patient this was. Estelle had an image in her mind of Claude, sitting under a tree, unconscious. The priest crossed her arms, and the girl asked if it was another patient who was very serious. The priest hesitated. To be honest, yes, the patient is very serious. The other patient was more serious than Mrs. Estelle. He said someone treated him that day. Whoever treated this patient must have been a very good healer. And the priest smiled. The priest raised a finger in the air. He said that even he, the head priest, had magically just alleviated the symptoms of suffering. Estelle was surprised. Those were all words that said that the priest knew everything. She tried not to give away with her appearance that she was the one who had saved the priest's other patient. The priest replied that the patient other was very curious to know the identity of the benefactor who had healed him. She looked at the priest attentively. The priest said that another patient had failed to keep that benefactor. I lay there silently listening to the priest's every word. But if the next chance comes along, maybe this patient won't miss it for anything. She looked at the priest in surprise. The priest only smiled sweetly. He knew everything without words. The priest said he's been talking out of his arse for too long. And he was very sorry. The girl took the priest's hand. And the priest helped her up off the pedestal. The priest said he just wanted to tell it. She said if a girl messed with him, she recommended definitely avoiding him. Estelle thought their connection wouldn't be because she wanted it to be. Mistress Estelle remembered that scene. When the little dragon was sitting there begging Claude not to die. The girl had just fallen for the little dragon's cloak. The priest said that the treatment was over for the day. He asked how the girl was feeling. The same said that she felt very relaxed and calm. The priest said it was a great blessing. She told the girl that she would see her next time. The girl walked quickly out of the temple doors. In front of the doors, stood and waiting for her was Rain. At this moment she was chatting with Celia by her attendants. The girl quickly turned around and greeted. Celia already knew that Estelle had come here for treatment. She asked if her treatment was finished. The girl suggested that Mistress retreat to a quiet place. They saw a restaurant nearby. The girls went inside and sat down on the chairs. They quickly read the menu. 
A little further away on the couch sat Celia's girl companions, and also standing there was Rain. Celia was the first to start the conversation. She turned to the girl, Miss Estelle. The girl kindly asked what she would have and showed her the list of dishes that were on the menu. The girl looked into Celia's eyes. They were very close. Then the girl shifted her gaze to the menu and quickly jabbed her finger at one of the names. Miss Estelle opted for plain tea. Celia laughed. She said she liked jasmine tea too and that they have very similar tastes. Celia turned to the girl, Miss Estelle, again. She asked if Miss Esther had seen today's paper. The girl said her mother and father miss her very much. Estelle slowly placed the cup on the saucer. She was stunned. Had Celia really said they missed her? Celia continued her story. She said that her parents hoped that Mrs. Estelle would come back. Celia also hoped so very much. The girl guessed right away. It was just as she expected. Her parents had definitely sent her to her, said she didn't know whether to come back or not. She said that her parents most likely wanted her back because of Mercedes's heritage, and not at all out of herself. Celia made a surprised face, as if she didn't know that at all. Miss Estelle said that Miss Celia's intentions are unknown, but at least she doesn't think the Count and Countess would want to see her. The girl opened her mouth in surprise. Did Estelle really not believe her words? Estelle said firmly that she didn't believe a word she said. The girls sat at the table and looked intently from each other. Celia also put her cup on the saucer. She said, well, of course. Estelle understood what the girl wanted to say with those words. Celia said the girl couldn't believe it because she was thrown out on a cold winter night like rubbish. Then I thought I'd ask her directly. She hadn't read it right. Estelle knew what her girlfriend was asking her now. She asked her about that affair. And the girl opened her mouth in surprise. Estelle sat looking at Miss Celia in surprise. She didn't quite know what to say to her. Now Celia was no longer smiling so sweetly. Her gaze was angry. She put a finger to her chin and wondered what else she should say. Estelle's mind was spinning with the supporting role the girl had spoken on at the ball. She heard everything right then, but she pretended not to understand what Miss Celia was saying. Celia started to scream. She asked the girl not to lie. If that wasn't true, then how could she so easily abandon her parents and leave without shedding a tear? They had raised her for years. Estelle wondered if she didn't give up on them and grab their trousers. And the girl looked for a moment into the mug of tea. The reflection in it was not pale at all, but the color of tea. Wouldn't they have thrown it away then? Estelle, looking into Celia's eyes, replied, Even if she didn't refuse, nothing would change. Celia, I said she should have tried something else. It's obvious, isn't it? The girl's soft and steady voice turned to a shout, and Miss Estelle was calm. She asked her interlocutor what she wanted to say to her. Celia took Estelle's hand with both hands. She looked pitifully into the girl's eyes. Celia suggested that we become good friends. I mean, it's an amazing coincidence. Celia couldn't believe what went into the book she read in her past life, but it turned out there was another person who had experienced the same thing. Wasn't that fate? And the girl asked for her seat back. The Mercedes legacy, either inherited or inherited by ECT. It was assumed to belong to the Brienne family. The Brienne family was so rich in the original because of this legacy. Miss Estelle looked at her interlocutor in surprise. And so Estelle jerked her hand out of Celia's grasp in a flash. She made such a sudden movement that the teacup flew to the floor. Everyone was stunned by what was happening. Miss Rain rushed to her mistress, and Miss Celia only gasped. She had not expected such impertinent behavior from Estelle, but Estelle was really pissed off now. She asked not to speak that way about what she had inherited from her ancestors. This legacy is not Celia's, not the Brienne family's. This legacy will never be theirs. Celia hadn't expected that answer. Asked the girl not to behave so rude. The girl turned around and started to walk away quickly. Estelle herself decided that the conversation was over. Celia tried to shout after her that it had been decided from the beginning. Celia says that maybe she was treated unfairly, but that this world put her in this position. Estelle denies this, although she has read the same book as Celia, but these words did not hurt Miss Estelle at all. She was silently trailing off. Suddenly she stopped and turned round. She asked Celia again what she had just said. What kind of book? The girl didn't understand what she was talking about, what she didn't understand. Celia shouted nervously. She said the girl was pretending not to know anything. Estelle turned and looked at her interlocutor in silence. She stood silent and didn't know what to say to her. She moved closer to the table and put her foot on the table leg. Estelle tells Celia that she keeps saying weird things afterwards about her past life and the world inside the novel. But it's not a dream, it's reality. Estelle said that Celie should wake up when it was time for her to do so. They stood with their hands on the table and looked into each other's eyes. They stood with their hands on the table and stared into each other's eyes. Miss Estelle was the first to pull away. She said it was time for her to leave. She had already wasted a lot of time on this conversation. Celia unequally gripped the table. Mentally, she thought, no, this can't be happening. There's no way that's a reality. She lowered her head. She was surrounded by her escort, and Mrs. Estelle went further and further away. The accompanying girls sat down and escorted Mistress Estelle with a glance. Estelle walked up to Rain. The girl asked if the mistress was all right after this conversation. 
Estelle said she was fine, except that it was very heavy in my chest after the talk. The girl ran Celia's words through her head once more. The Bryan family had been so rich in the original because of that legacy, but Celia was probably right. If she'd come to the county later, Estelle would have been thrown out, and all my aunt's inheritance would have been lost, and that pissed the girl off more than anything, in the helpless original, but it wasn't like that now. And in Estelle's mind, the stone that hung on her chest glowed. Everything is fine now, and there's nothing for her to worry about. Estelle reiterated that she was fine. No need to worry. Rain said that if that's the case, it's all right. But she saw that Madame had turned pale. So she said to hurry back home. The girl started to walk towards the river. At that time, someone called Estelle and asked her to wait. The girl looked round. Miss Estelle was called out by one of the girls accompanying Celia. The girl had red hair. She ran up to Estelle and asked her what the hell she'd said to her mistress. Calmly, she said it was nothing. The girl asked her not to lie. Miss Celia had this grief-stricken expression on her face as soon as she left. Estelle noticed that all these people, they're all very worried about Celia. I wanted to deal with these people, but Estelle told the girl it was all right. Estelle apologized and said that if she was interested in their conversation, they would be better off asking Miss Celia personally, not her. But the girl wouldn't calm down. She said it wasn't about interest. It was about Mrs. Estelle apologizing to Mrs. Celia. Estelle didn't think herself guilty, and therefore she was not going to apologize to the girl. At that moment, Estelle heard a child's voice. That's right, it's that girl. A child's voice said, Look over there, Claude. Estelle realized that Claude was somewhere nearby. She looked round quickly. In front of her stood Claude No reincarnated with blonde hair, and on his shoulder sat a dragon. Claude smiled sweetly at the girl. He recognized her. Mrs. Estelle continued to look at the young man. It was definitely him. It was Claude, and she had not expected to see him here. The red-haired girl wondered where Estelle was looking while talking, and Claude had already come very close to Estelle. He bent down and asked if she was doing well. Everyone present was surprised. It's Baron Lambert. At the same time, outside the capital, someone was looking for His Majesty the Archduke. His subjects were nervous. How would they be able to find him if he decided to hide? But they didn't just need to find him. After all, this was an emergency. The young man was sure that everyone was currently shining their shoes to look good in the eyes of the heir to the Mercedes family. But where is His Highness? He should be at the front of the line. He should probably be in the capital. Doesn't he know that the heir to the Mercedes family has appeared? There's no such thing. How can he not know it when everyone is talking about it? If it's His Highness who leads a reclusive life, it's possible. It made sense. As in the case of Archduke Karlstein, he locks himself away or hides as soon as the symptoms of overload return. But he's not some wild animal. In any case, the situation is very urgent, so you need to contact him very urgently. One of the men was surprised. Well, how can you contact him? One of the young men raised his glasses. With their spy on the Crown Prince's side, Estelle looked at Claude and asked, How did he end up here? Claude also didn't think they would meet so casually. Claude wondered if he had, by chance, interrupted their conversation with the girl. Estelle said no. The red-haired girl turned to the Baron. She didn't understand how he was with this man. But the Baron interrupted her at once. With this man? He told the lady that her words were a little impolite. The girl meant that it was dangerous for a noble like the Baron to socialize with such a man. But the Baron did not at all understand what the girl meant by danger. Still, it didn't sound good. Estelle didn't realize what was wrong with Claude now. He was now showing that they were very close to him. The dragon looked menacingly at the girl. The girl was telling him this because she was thinking of him. Doesn't he know that? After the ball, there were all sorts of rumors. I couldn't have her mention the white disease. Then Claude would immediately realize who she was. The red-haired girl did not calm down. She said that Estelle might be of good birth. She might be supported by many, but this woman was cursed by God and disease. Easton couldn't stand it and tried to stop the girl. She said she would not tolerate such disrespect any longer and asked the girl to leave now.